there. Um, any additions or deletions to the staff has no. All right. And it's time for oral communications. <clears throat> And if I can see by a show of hands how many people think they might want to speak. Okay. All right. Well, we've changed our time to half five minutes, unless so many people want to talk. So, all right. Thank you. Um, so, you may. Um, hello everyone, uh, my name is Tina Toe and I'm a resident of Boulder Creek. Uh, I recently applied for the administrative committee but then I was unable to come to the meeting. But I want to let you know that I'm here and I'm um, interested in the environmental committee. I have a master's degree in environmental science and I think it would be a really valuable addition. So I uh, submitted my application to Holly and please consider me for the next meeting. Oops. And now we're <laughs> I thought maybe the power had gone out because that's a normal thing here. <laughs> anyway, uh, so yes, please consider me for the environmental committee. I will be out of town for uh, two weeks in March, but I will make it to the meeting on March 21st. Okay, yeah. okay. So, well, thank you for introducing yourself. So, no one else put their paw up, right? So, unfinished business. Uh, the first item is committee meetings, and we need to figure out when we're going to have the committee meetings, um, what days and what times. So, which one did you want to start with? Um, let's start with let's start with the environmental committee. Margaret. The, I think there is a, at the moment, there is a tentative standing date and time. Um, looking through my calendar and refreshing my own memory about when that is. They have been. Um, the, third the, third, the third Tuesday of every month. Um, my schedule is somewhat constrained by work during the, the work hours, but fairly open and flexible. So I'm working with staff and the availability of the space we have for committee meetings and okay. yeah. and Bill, you're on that committee. Correct. And then my um, I'm just starting a new job, uh, so but I, I think that I could commit to. Um, um, I would like to maybe see if to have the um, environment on the on that Tuesday. Tuesday is fine. Yeah. Uh, 4 p.m. and then have the engineering committee right after from from 4 to 5 and then en engineering from 5 to 6 um, for that one day every month. And, uh, and, and if there's, um, I don't want to the little effect, but there's there's not, it's not possible for me to, to come to a 9 a.m. you know, admit meeting during the day. Otherwise, I, you know, I like to, to not serve on the committee because that's basically just telling my employer over the hill that I, I, need to, I need to take a full day off work. And that's just not feasible for me. And then also my thought was that um, having these meetings, I know it's going to be a little bit of hardship on staff, but it also includes, um, you know, for the public committee meetings. I'm sure that a lot of them are just in my same situation where they also work over the hill so that they, um, you know, can attend. So. I, you know, I really don't want to, I know we kind of well, fought back with this before last, last year or so. Anyway, so that's, anyway, that's, anyway two, I'm, I'm really, I can work with Tuesday at 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. for both environmental and engineering committee. <coughs> Having meetings in the operation building at 4 o'clock do cause a big hardship on the staff. When they come in, they change, at the end of the day, they do their work. If it was going to have to be a meeting that, I would say we have it at a different location. Mm -hmm. um, and it's and you're starting to ask staff to attend more evening meetings, and they add up. I mean, you, we have several committees. We have board meetings. We have Sigma. We have weekend meetings now with Sigma. 
it's starting to put a, a burden on staff, especially ones with families. Well, my feeling, <laughs> I mean, if this if this room needs to be treated and needed as a locker room one day a month, then you know maybe that cartoon in Desenzo about you know Lompico as hillbillies applies because you know I mean that's just to me is ridiculous. Are there alternative locations that are close enough by, like the firehouse? Is there a spot at the firehouse, or <coughs> is there a like the use of um, a room at the elementary well, school. There, there probably or... is other locations. We haven't, you know, obviously we, we meet at other locations before for other meetings, mm -hmm. and the room size for committee meetings can be, small. uh, can be smaller. So mm -hmm. we haven't really looked into it. I'm just saying that this, you know, the operations building is the operations building, and there's, and there's a lot of things that go on in here. Yeah. And I'm not, you know, I, I take, you know, the word hillbilly was, was uncalled for, but. Um, you know, we do have responsibilities for our staff, and next it's lunch, then it's the morning meetings, and then, and then it's, it's the point where they're pushed out of their facility. Mm -hmm. It was bad enough when the board table came in here and, and pushed their facility to the point that they didn't even feel welcome in the room anymore because of the nice chairs. When they come in coated with mud, they got to stay away from the good furniture because they're, they're filthy. Um, and that's the nature of the beast in this job. Um, I definitely, you know, staff wants to work with the board, but you know, it's, it's a two-way street, and I think a different location would be uh, would be, be the way to solve the facility issue, but you are starting to, to load up staff with, with a lot of a lot of uh, after hours meetings. I mean, I'm mean, sorry that I'm really, you know, I said that, but, you know, this is sort of frustrating to me to, you know, again, if, if you really want, if you really don't want to have these meetings at night, then just... I don't really care. I don't. I don't want to even argue about this anymore. Take me off the well, meeting. So I, that's it. I don't. I don't want to argue about it. Uh, Bob, you want to say something? Yeah, I think there was a couple points that came up, and you know, one of the things that we we have to be concerned about is that the people that serve on the board and, and the committees also work for a living too, or at least a lot of them do. Maybe not mm -hmm. everybody. I think mm -hmm. on the budget committee, perhaps both the people on there might be retired, and we'll, we'll find out. When we, survey them. But a good share of people are going to work themselves during the day, and for them to take off during the day, unless they have a job that is flexible like that, which as consultants we you have, know, some. Kind of have some, not all the time, but have some. But a lot of people don't have that flexibility. And so I, I've been thinking a little bit about the, the, the load on staff too, and uh, you know, I, I do get that, and it may be that perhaps um, we move to where Staff doesn't have to attend both board meetings a month, perhaps it's one, or they can telephone in or something like that if they want to be able to balance the personal life and, and the work life. So uh, I think that's something that, that could be thought of as well. Um, but I think we need to make accommodations for uh, our board members for their work life um, as well. And four to six means actually you're leaving work at three. And that's assuming that traffic isn't what it can be as you're coming down 17 from San Jose, which can sometimes be a bit of a drag. So um, that, that's actually meaning if you want to get a full day in, you have to get to work at, uh, let's say, 5 in the morning. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty big sacrifice on, on Bill's part as well. So you understand. Do we have to meet monthly? Right. Can we? Is that what you? Right. Was, well, was, I'm wondering. Um, it's it's a it's a wonderful opportunity to have staff participate, educate us, have committee members also come up to speed. But maybe a quarterly or an every other month meeting would be sufficient and um, uh, flexible about evening hours to the extent that staff is available to do that. And I like the idea of an alternative location. I don't, I, I don't want know. to impose on staff here. I don't know why we have to have committee meetings every month. Uh, if, if we could leave that flexibly to staff, if, yeah. this, if staff thinks that there's more input that they need, a special meeting could be scheduled, but we could have a standing meeting less frequently than that. Any other comments? Could the, could the scheduling be left to the members of the committee to schedule among themselves where it's convenient and where it's convenient to have their meeting? I think the where is important for disclosure and posting for um, community location and agendas ahead of time, but 
So, it would be helpful to have things published ahead of time so that people would know, okay, right. that this committee meeting is always at this location on yeah. the something right. or other right. of the month right. or the quarter. The committee itself could figure that out and figure it out uh, a week, a month, or a quarter in advance. You right. Know what I mean? Right. Or when. Yeah, I, I think, uh, for example, um, you know, the Environmental Committee has some important tasks to do. I don't know that that necessarily requires every month a review because some of these are pretty, going to be pretty lengthy, right? right? And, um, but, you know, the Engineering Committee, we've got a lot of stuff coming up. And so maybe that one is um, uh, once a month for a while until it, you know, shakes out. I mean, we certainly also have to be looking at the inventory of our system that we need to do. Uh, and so I think there might be some discussion the committee should have around that. Um, mm -hmm. When we get to budget and admin, I also have opinions about that. Um, but uh, those are, I think those have been scheduled for daytime. So yes. the daytime meetings aren't as cumbersome. As long as we can keep it, you know, not in the early, early morning when staff comes to work, the lunchtime, and we have done that pretty well. Did, did we poll the public members of admin and budget to make sure they can make those meeting times? That's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. All that means is that I work till late at night. <laughs> <laughs> of early. So I'll be there until 9 or 10. Um, okay. Well, but, you know, I think the alternative location, I mean, maybe a combination of several things, we can make it work. Um, because I think it's important that. You know, yes. board members around their committees and, and, and work. It's just we've got to find that happy medium. And I know Boulder Creek Library has a smaller meeting room about half the size or about this size. And I don't know what their hours are, but you know, possibly that 4 o'clock hour we could have down there. But uh, I, I think that's worth looking into. And we have not looked into smaller alternative sites as of yet. So what I'm hearing is we have to look into another site. And the library sounds great. They'll let you use the room there. Yeah. We've used it before for training during the day. Uh, I just don't know what their hours are. Yeah, you know, well, they usually are like seven. Or yeah. Depends on what day of the week it is. But Rick, you have keys to every public meeting building. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. But we can, we'll definitely look into it. And if we can keep the after hours meetings, it sounds like the majority of the committee meetings will be kept during the day. Okay. Um, and then. You know, and we'll try to work in, in so, a, a, an alternative facility. So we and won't make a decision on that. And I think, you know, Steve, if, if that will work with staff, and I think Steve's idea of the, of the committee getting together and, and pick the, the times. Um, if we have another location, you know, we can probably make the 4 o'clock time work. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, pushing it to the end of the day works pretty well. Yeah. Too. That'd be nice. One more committee. Well, so that's okay in Zyandi at Fire Hall at night. Well, we, the, let up this pretty much came to the, we let the committee come to the conclusion. I do believe their quarterly meeting will be held here, and their monthly meeting or whatever special meetings can be held over at Zion Fire. Right. Um, I think we I think a lot of committees worked out. They they worked Thank well you. together and, and are well on their way. Great. So that leaves the other two committees that you and I are on. So speak your piece. Um. I think budget needs to be monthly, and 9 o'clock is fine. Uh, okay, is. 9 o'clock is fine with me. And uh, admin committee... Um, what day, though? Oh, um, well, my ideal day would be Friday. That's not my idea. Tuesday <laughs> or Wednesdays? Well, I can do either. <laughs> I just have to show up my schedule. Wednesdays, yeah. Wednesdays aren't good for us. We have a safety meeting in here in the mornings. On every Wednesday, so. And we may want to check because the person that did respond from the public afternoons were better, which is why we scheduled that first one to be the for the two for the two, budget. Two, two, two to four is just a non-starter. It's the same thing. I have to take the whole day off. So are you not attending the one on the twentieth, or you make I, the I, I, I will probably rearrange it for one, okay. but it can't be there permanently either. It's got to be in the morning or at night, um, you know, so I can shuffle my schedule. Why don't we just... We can discuss it at the meeting that we have mm -hmm. in a week and a half. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have an empty office. Don't we have a possibility? 
Which so, meeting are you going to do? Yeah. So, <laughs> okay, that was not. There's a meeting set yeah, up on the 20th true. for the budget and finance. On the 20th? On the 20th, yes. And that's a Wednesday? That's. Uh, yes. At what time? 20th at 2. 2. At 2. Well, I guess we could live without Bob if we could all be well, board Well, like, 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 like I say, it's for one meeting I can shuffle things around, but as a ongoing regular thing, that does not work either. That's the same issue that, that Bill has. It's right in the middle of my work day. Okay. I'm still waiting for that lottery ticket, so. Well, so, okay, what about okay. an admin committee? Um, admin committee, again, the any, nine day, any day, 9 o'clock. Um, Tuesday. But the, the frequency of that, I think, is going to be driven, in my opinion, a lot more by what we need to do on the new website, because to me, the admin committee's number one priority is that new website. And we haven't, I haven't got, I don't know where we are with that. I know we had It'll be in your first meeting, meeting we're, we're moving that way. Yeah, but I mean, to me, however frequently we need to meet to get that website up and running within a very quick period of time, um, I know there's going to be a lot of document management that's going to come with that new website. So I think everybody needs to be prepared for a fair amount of work on on that. Mm -hmm. And the committee members need to be prepared to pitch in and help out under Stephanie and the staff's direction on what to do. I'm not admin, though. Yeah. She's Who's going to be admin? I'm admin. I, if it's something that I have a vested interest in. Yeah, I'll they'll be there. <laughs> the pro pro be, appropriate the staff will be there. Okay. And when it comes to the website, <laughs> uh, water, the watershed environmental and finance will be there. Mm -hmm. There'll be a, an engineer. There'll be pretty much the management team will be involved in the website. Website, I'll get to. That's, uh, <laughs> that covers all aspects of the district. I mean, I think there's there are other things about admin that I think are probably not as lengthy, like, you know, I mean, I've been advocating for a long time now, moving the board meetings to the Felton Library when it's ready and all that, uh, live stream of the board meetings, um, you know, those are things that I think that are somewhat compact. The bigger things are going to be around, do we want to make another run at board policies or other policies or... Um, we have the record retention right. policy. We, there's, 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 there's well, things. We never finished the record retention. No, but we have that started, and those will be coming to the admin committee. I, I think those are not. I don't see those as being really lengthy things like the budget. So, is there anybody here tonight that that we picked for the admin committee? Nope. We were like three people. Did we did we survey them? Are they okay with a morning meeting, or are they? I can't remember exactly who was agreeable to what, but um, I, I'll have to look at it again. It's it's probably a really good idea to um, set a first meeting and let the group decide when, now that you have agreed that possibly a, a quarterly meeting or a bi-monthly would work, if we could do that for all the committees, have them meet, and, and then when the whole group is together, decide. Yeah. Um, so, right now we do have a budget meeting on February 20th at 2 p.m. Uh, we could schedule an admin meeting um, and for 9 o'clock on a Tuesday and see who comes. Can we do it on the 19th? Is that enough time? Sure. Well, is, enough, is it enough notice time calling for? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Let's do that. Okay, at nine. At nine. Okay. Is there anybody in? Oh, there's. Uh, I Ms. Lowen, you want to speak? I do. I have recently appointed to the Lompico Oversight Committee, and I have attended almost every meeting since its inception in 2016. And I would just like to say, this committee decided at the very first meeting that they would accommodate people who worked, and they would meet after hours, and they would schedule around people who worked. There were several people on the committee who worked. They are valuable to the committee. I would like to see... Uh, I know it's an inconvenience, but I would like to 
encourage people to be on these committees who do work because these are the real leaders in our community and if they have really valuable jobs and they're uh, managers and things, those are the kind of people that we want. So I think we need to be able to accommodate that and not turn anybody away. And then when we have board openings, we want people to apply for the board knowing that that are valuable in their jobs too and be able to come to committee meetings and be active in it. So I think I'd like to see a shift in attitude. And I just have one final remark. when. Director Smallman said he would not be able to come during the day and that he might as well just remove himself from the committees. I heard some kind of self-satisfied remarks around me. That attitude is gone. This is a new board. This is a new way we're going to be doing things. We are not going to be treating people like that. Bill Smallman received the most votes ever when he was elected. He needs to be respected whether you agree with his opinions or not. <coughs> Respect his position and respect that he needs to take part in this board and in the committees, and we need to accommodate him and anyone who comes after him, whether we agree with him or not, because we're above all that. We're a better district than that. And, uh, <coughs> yes, um, I don't have any disagreement with the process of getting to uh, times for committee meetings. But there have been some postings in uh, social media by Director Smallman in this case regarding this issue and about trying to accommodate people who specifically have uh, an anti glyphosate position. And from those recent um, Facebook posts, um, I'll quote a couple of sentences. Um, first of those is, we, and of course I don't know who we is, um, have someone who is anti glyphosate, wants to join, but also works over the hill, and we want these meetings at 5 p.m and then continue. So at the regular meeting, we can make the board policy menu more clear and Jenny Gomez term, and then go through the recruitment process all over again. And then the following um, comment, okay, uh, in this uh, you know, posting thread, says, those who uh, thought small use of glyphosate was okay need not apply. So I think there's uh, some push towards finding people who accommodate the particular views of at least one director and to accommodate their time in this, and I find that inappropriate. Thank you. Anybody else? You do not let Jenny go on that recommendation. Okay. Uh, uh, Bob? I, um, in a public letter. The meeting um, time for the admin committee uh, would be nine. nine. But I would like to make sure that our public members can make that. Right. Sure. Yeah, and if they can't, check with him. Yeah, and if they, but if they, plan. the second part is they can't, then we may need to revisit okay. the time. Okay, fine. Fine. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Um, board policy update is the next item. Um, there was well, there was a second part of this memo was. Uh, the uh, com about committees about minutes on this oh, on this that's island. Right. It, there's two different contradicting statements, and I do believe it, it, it should read that the district secretary shall record the minutes for the board of directors and committee meetings um, okay. in the board policy manual. Right. Okay. In the board policy manual. Yes. Yeah, I believe that that was a. Now this where we've moved on to the. Policy manual? Yeah. yeah. Well, I guess we, yeah, it was in part of this first the, committee's. That's really yeah. yeah, it was part of the committee section, so it was in my first yeah. memo. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I think what happened there was just, a, a bad red line. Yeah, I agree. Okay. It's just cleaning up. Um, are there any board members who have some additions that they want? Okay. Yeah, so I guess in addition to uh, the item that Rick identified here, and I'll work on the, uh, to figure out which words to, to note, there were two other, there were three other changes to the board policy manual that I wanted to propose. So are we to board policy manual now? Yeah. 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 Uh, the two change, the two new additions, were uh, the, the first one is the district secretary um, records the minutes for both uh, regular meetings and committee Oh, that's what we're mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the first one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So, Rick, I had um, submitted a document with some edits. Did that get included? In there? Mm -hmm. No. It doesn't look like it did. I didn't see it. Okay. So, give me just a second here to fire up the. Um, the edits? Document. I thought it would be. I'm yeah, I'm I looking too as well. Too. It's not in there, so. You know, I looked to see if you made yep. any changes. Yeah, I, I, I actually did. Oh, on the agenda, I mean, I have three. Well, well that's those Rick's. Three that, that was Rick's. Oh, right. That's so, I had three other changes. Okay. There were two additions based on conversation at last meeting and another red line uh, correction that is a, a section didn't get deleted due to a red line failure. Okay, very good. So it was a pretty simple thing to do, but um, apparently it didn't get into the board packet. Fortunately, this did, so we can still act on it. Um, well, I want to make some. And I know you, you did as well. Can I ask a question while, you're, while we're waiting for you to pull that up? Sure. I, I just want to clarify in this previous remark, Mr. Smallman, are you saying that you don't want to accept anyone into the committees, depending on your beliefs about glyphosate? I, I just, well, recently I just heard that, that and I, I hadn't read Well, recently that got resolved, so we've actually banned glyphosate, so that that's right. out of the, that now is out of the question, but before that meeting, my understanding was, and my feelings were, was that my desire was to ban glyphosate. So, so you in want other to ban words, people based on I, well, no, I can't. I, as a committee member, I can only, as a director, I can vote or not vote for somebody to get on the environmental committee. Uh -huh. Personally, yes. if, I, if there was somebody that wanted to get on the environmental committee, yes. and if I knew that they were in favor of using glyphosate. I would not vote for them. And that's all. I'm not. I'm not saying that. I thought that. I yeah. thought that you uh, were I, open to all ideas. Uh, well, I'm against glyphosate. That's my. That's my opinion, and that's my right as a board, as your board, and that's what I'm listening to my constituency, and that's my position. No glyphosate. Period. This, so. this is district council. I'm jumping in um, just because this discussion isn't part of the agenda item. But I just want to say that I agree with Brown Act reasons. Can't be discussed at this time. Uh, that's, that's just what you. So, do you found what you passed for? Um, not, not quite yet. Go ahead and go on and I'll catch up with you. Yeah. Okay. So unfortunately, I had asked previously, since we are asking for uh, staff to cut their budgets, that we cut our stipend because um, and cut it in half from a hundred dollars to fifty that we cut along with everybody else which would save six thousand dollars a year on the regular board meeting so two two of um, board meetings a month, we'd have 24. I'd like to comment on that. Well, you can comment. Okay. $100 a meeting is a fair amount for us to come down here and review the, the, the thing. It's actually, it's not a lot of money. Thing. And I think the, this board needs to really focus on the meat and potatoes and not the small chunk change of, you know, um, you know, that's how, but the public loves it. The public is more, more like public grandstanding. They're going to, we're going to say, we're going to save you 6,000 bucks. It's about 17 cents per water bill. Okay, that's what we're talking about here. And I know all, all of us have old, semi-retired and semi-retired buddy duddies, you know, we got on this board <laughs> to get that $100. But in the future, you know, when, when people, there, there could be a young person, a talented person in that, you know, hey, what, they're not going to give me a, at least a fair, decent amount for meeting, at the meeting. We have a lot of small costs at this district, but the benefits are, are outweighed from the amount of money. <coughs> and one of them is this meeting stipends. So that would, it's a fair amount to get, um, to come to this meeting. In other words, if, if that will attract in the future somebody, 
that comes to this valley that wants to run on the board that gets fair. Scotts Valley, to put this in perspective, Scotts Valley pays $200 <coughs> per meeting, and they also pay for health care. So their, the cost for their directors is well over $100,000. And we have a lot of smaller costs. We have education grants. I'm, I'm promoting an a internship program. That's going to cost a small amount of money. But the benefits outweigh these small things. So a lot of people get really attracted to these cuts, these small cuts. Like Greg Caput ran around Watsonville saying, I'm going to cut 30% of his salary. But you know what? That's only a few dollars off the property tax, your property tax bill. You, we, you want a $120,000 supervisor running and doing it with the talent to run that the county. You don't want some guy that's going to tell you, hey, we're going to cut, we're going to cut this 6000 bucks. It's meaningless, completely meaningless. So you're against, you're against the, you're cutting the staff cuts then too, right? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm a, we're, what we're talking about is oh, so oh, we're going to only get, we get $100 to, to and we, I, I spent, a lot of time outside this meetings meeting, you don't understand. And that the hundred dollars to come down here prepared is okay. It's a trip to the grocery store, you know, and it's a fair, it's a fair decent amount. So, and then we're just talking about, hey, we're gonna really, you know, I would rather have a board of directors. There's so many other areas where we can save hundreds of hundreds of thousands of dollars. I want talent. I want talent. Business talent to serve you to do that well, and, and get, a, get a fair case of money. I think we're, we're still in board conversation here, correct? Yes, we're still in board conversation. So if, if I may offer um, maybe a compromise solution here, because I, I think the point you're making about we need to be looking at all aspects of the budget and how we're going to um, uh, reduce our operating costs, and, I, and, and that's that's sort of in every area of focus. That was some of the things that we uh, discussed uh, last fall uh, in great detail. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, take this topic of the board budget within the context of the entire board budget and have that conversation during a budget committee meeting or during the budget setting process and see how we can come up with the reduction for the board budget overall uh, within that. Um, there's other aspects of the board budget that I think we need to look at in terms of attorney time during the board meetings, um, how we do our videotaping. There may be, uh, there, with new board members, we may have actually increased costs for us attending the CSDA meetings, if that's something that the board members want to go to, uh, the annual meeting. And so I think we need to look at it in a broader place rather than just focus on one individual item right now. Well, I totally disagree. Okay. And I don't think I'm grandstanding. I, you start adding up 6,000 here, 10,000 there, 4,000, you start adding that up. It starts to become a lot of money and I don't think anybody runs for the board to get a hundred dollars a meeting. I really don't. And we can talk about all that other stuff too. And you know I asked about this quite a while ago and I'm it's I think it needs to change. That we need to do our part. And I'm not saying that it doesn't, I just think to now is we should do it during the budget process, not tonight. Why? Because that's when we deal with the budgets and we deal with the entire board. Budget. We're talking about the board policy manual here, mm -hmm. pardon me. And the board policy manual defines the stipend. And we can deal with that at the budget committee meeting and make an adjustment to the board policy right. manual at that time. I, I totally disagree with you because this is not, this is board policy. It is not budget. It's board policy. I agree. I think it should be, it should go to the public to, um, budget. Yeah. So, Margaret. <clears throat> 
I would prefer to follow Bob Holtz's advice to take this with the budget committee. Nobody runs for the board for the stipend to get rich. There's that's right. not not the issue. At the same time, all work has value, and to diminish the value that we put into this, that we bring to this, I don't think is a good idea. Well, I'm not trying to diminish the value. I'm trying to say, hey folks, hey environmental, we want you to cut. Hey, um, field staff, we want you to cut stuff out of your budget. I want to set an example that we're willing to cut also. That's all I got to say. Do you have anything? No, I have no problem with agreeing right now to cut the stipend to 50% of what it currently is. And I also don't have a problem with debating it during a budget meeting. Okay. Um, then the other thing I would like to see that a member of the public shall not, uh, it says that in here, public, a member of the public shall not, shall serve on no more than one standing committee that's in here. So we have a bit of a problem. And Why? We're going to need maybe Gina's advice. So it turns out the edits that I made did get in here, but not in red line form. Okay. So they're, they're, go in as, they're in as the final approval, which is fine. So on page uh, 18. Which number 18? Uh, <laughs> the one in the middle. So the middle, the middle, the middle and the right. So, we can all be, so the left is 29, the middle is 18, and the right is 21. Okay. okay. So um, the, in about two-thirds of the way down the page, it says, regardless start date, the terms of public members of the administrative budget and finance Engineering Environmental Committee shall end on December 31st of each year. And the next line, members of the public shall serve in no more than one standing committee at a time. Those were the two additions that I had proposed to the board policy manual. So those are new. But Gina, they weren't, they, they aren't in as red lines. So is it okay for us still to talk about those? Gina? Well, frankly, I, I would like to see the I thought the red lines from last time were adopted. Yeah, they were, and I added two new red lines, actually three red lines in, two additions, one deletion, but those red lines didn't get into the agenda. They are, as red lines, they are in as final document. Okay, well that, that shouldn't be a problem as long as it's clear what the board is voting on. So okay. If the language you want is in the document that's in front of the board, yes. such that it's not ambiguous, um, then it's not a problem that it's not red line. Okay, so those are the two things. We talked about that at the last meeting. Right. And so I brought them back as um, a proposal for us to discuss and see if we wanted to agree on them. Okay. Any other comments by the board on those two items? Uh, uh, Rick? Um, so <laughs> just a little clarification, so that means on shall end, their term ends on December 31st, so they'd have to be reappointed? Is that how it, I just want to be sure of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other board members have a question? Would it be of any value to have some additional instruction in here that applications for reappointment shall happen in October or some other time frame so that come uh, January, right. We have a slate of possible candidates to select for reappointment or new appointment. That'd be good to spell it out because then it answers board members' questions. You know, when are you going to get this ad out, and when you know, yeah, when are we going to appoint? So, some language you'd like me to add? That would work. Oh, I love having a stenographer. Um, um, having um, uh, shoot, that's a good idea. Having uh, the, the 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 board shall work with staff to describe committee appointment opportunities for publication in October. Is that an appropriate time frame, two months ahead of time? So that in January, so, so in, in October, so that candidates are available for January appointment. And then the existing committee members would reapply at that same right. time if right. they wanted to continue. Right. Sorry, for publication in October, so... So that candidates wishing to apply 
uh, or reapply. How about so the candidates can be appointed in January? Appointed or reappointed. wanted to clarify something, if I might. Um, when you were talking about the amount of the stipend and, uh, and the amount that that would save per year, I assume that $6,000 yeah. was per year. Um, $6,000. Did that take into account the fact that there are going to be twice as many meetings? I wasn't clear yes. on how that math worked. Yeah, because we're getting, if we get 200 I mean, $200 a month, mm -hmm versus getting 100 a month, mm -hmm. that is the difference oh, I per see. person. So you're saying that it would have increased $6,000, but now it won't? Well, only if we vote for it. Yeah. So if I'm doing the math right, you're going to be getting the same amount per month, but you're going to be coming to twice as many meetings. Right. So it's going to be half as much per meeting. Right. Okay. Right. It's set, it's set yeah. at $100 yeah. a month, and then it's changed it to half. So now we're having two meetings a month. It'll yeah. keep it to be on par with this last yeah. year's budget yeah. versus it creating an increase. An increase. Okay. Thank you. I just wanted to make okay. sure I understood. And Thanks. Nancy, you had your hand up? Oh, thank you. I wasn't. I can't um, hardly yeah. see. Yeah. Thank you, Lois. Um, um, I'm Nancy Nisi, Boulder Creek, and um, I question the need or rationale for uh, limiting uh, any individual from serving on more than one committee. If they're qualified and if the board chooses them, that doesn't make any sense at all to me. So um, I would think the board would want to leave that out. Well, we actually had a lot of people apply to be on committees, which really hasn't happened before, and there is only <coughs> So many we can deal with, and we feel like other people should have an opportunity that wants to be on the committee. And why, uh, why limit yourself for a long period of time when yeah. maybe that won't be the case in two years? Like, yeah. well, then we can change the policy. <laughs> I'm just saying that maybe you know, go ahead and, and select separate people to be on different committees instead of putting it into the policy manual to say that, you know, maybe in two years you don't get as many applicants and maybe somebody yes. wants to serve on multiple committees. So, you know, maybe yeah. this is a limiting thing for you to, to do this year. Well, okay. it was limiting before <coughs> because they only had one person on committee. And we're having, we've got committees now that have three committee members. And we, we, you know, we had, we had like five people apply for the environmental committee. We didn't pick them all. Uh, Mark? I'm Mark Lee from Baton Lomond. I kind of agree with the concept of having people serve on each committee separately because there's a lot of work that has to be digested and I, the way I'm looking at this is citizens should become specialists in the area that they're tackling for the district. By spreading and being members of multiple districts you really kind of lose your focus. So I would agree that that's a good policy. I don't agree with having multiple members on multiple committees. Okay. Also, before I finish, is, do we have an internet website here and a password? Wi-Fi? What is it? Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi? I'd have to go get it for you. Thank you. Okay. I need it for the and, uh, and agenda item coming up. Okay. Um, I, I noticed that you said that one of the rationales for cutting the stipend was that you've asked staff to cut <coughs> Their program budgets. It's that I haven't. I've been out of town. I haven't been to the 
Last meeting, is this something that was agendized at a previous meeting, the board's instruction to the staff to cut? And if not, is that something that's on a future agenda? I'm just wondering when there'll be discussion about these cuts that you've asked staff to make. Okay. Um, when the three of us new board members, when we ran for the board, one of our things we said we were going to do was look at costs and try to cut costs where we can. So, so far, we haven't had a meeting. Um, well, we have a meeting tonight with the Environmental Committee, uh, and we're going to see some of the budget stuff. But this will be the first time, and we may not vote on anything tonight. We might take it to another meeting, and if we want to cut some things, and vote on it. So the board has, just to clarify, the board has not instructed staff to make cuts at this point. No, but they know that we want them, that they need to be taking a hard look at their at their budget. Has the board communicated that formally to the staff? Has there been a board meeting where that's happened? Uh, we've kind of talked about it, but I, yeah. So I think the, the key thing to remember here on the, on the board budget is that over the last two years, even though formally the board has had uh, only one meeting a month, effectively they wound up having two with special meetings. So effectively you really had two meetings a month, it just was more special meetings and regular meetings. And what we decided to do uh, at our last, or actually a couple meetings ago I guess, was go to two meetings a month. <coughs> With respect to anything that was discussed during the campaign, uh, very little of that has been formally put into place yet because we're December, January, I think we're in our fourth meeting. So these are being brought to the board in a methodical, workmanlike fashion. And uh, certainly the budget discussion is going to be a big one coming up soon since we have to get our budget ready very quickly here, certainly by mid-year at the latest. So there will be a lot of things that are going to be discussed as part of that process. And it will be fully uh, agendized and brought to the public as we're doing it. And in committee, we're certainly going to be looking at a lot of the, the numbers as well. Any other comments? Uh, Deborah? Yes, Deborah Lowen. Uh, I have two requests for board annual changes updates. Um, one has to do with the Lompico Oversight Committee, going back to that, on page 18, and I don't know which page 18, but the one I was looking at, on page 18. It is page 18 in the middle. In the middle, I think. Yeah. Um, I would like you to strike, it, it, when it describes the number of people on the committee, it now says no more than five members. That is not the wording of the resolution of the um, merger document. It says it shall consist of five members. And I'd like that change to shall consist of five members instead of no more than because that has been a problem in the past. Um, everybody find that? Yes. And then on page 19, this came up at the last one week oversight and maybe Stephanie can address it. Um, I think the board manual still says all committee public members have to uh, do a form 700. And we have since found out that that does not apply to public members, only to elected people, so that they're essentially telling the district to knock it off. And I think we need to re-describe that in the board manual. I think it's been misunderstood, the law on that. Since the bottom. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes. It is not a big deal, except that it is not required of members of the public. And so we ought to act like we understand the law and remove that. It's only for specific classes. Generally, it's for elected people and staff members who have the authority to spend money. So if I can read the, the paragraph, it says, Committee members shall comply with the obligations and responsibilities of office, including an obliga the obligation to comply with the disclosure requirements of the Political Reform Act, Form 700, the reporting categories made applicable to the directors by San Lorenzo Valley Water District local conflict of interest shall apply to the members of to the members of the committee. Members, I see we've got a bad red line there, yeah, too. Yeah, and, and conflicts of, like you know, it's the code of conduct, or conflict of interest code. Yes. Missing word. So, um, are you saying strike the entire paragraph? Um, 
public members, it has to be excluded everyone else. <coughs> it still applies to. Including the conflict of interest. Yes, so what we're working on the charter for the Lompico Oversight Committee, and included in the charter is an ethics policy that is adopted by the committee. So it's not the Form 700 requirement, but we create our own ethics policy on conflict of interest, and everyone has to agree to that. And each committee could certainly write something up similar. And, and it's a, it's something j all charters have. So it's not a hard thing, it's boilerplate kind of item. If, if you, want, you want to be sure that public members are a, have an ethics policy about conflict of interest, then that would be a simpler way to do it, to include it in a charter. And then I just have one last comment on the limitation of two people of, of you can't apply for more than one committee at a time. I do like the idea, and I think what it's based on is um, if you're on a, for instance, if you're on the board here, you can't be on a board, a board for the school district, fire district. It, it's already a law that you can't be on more than one board at a time, and I think the reason for that is there could be a conflict, and there could certainly be a problem with the Brown Act violation if somebody is on several committees and then talking to other people, and so this just simplifies it, and I think it's really cool, and given that we have so many people interested in participating, I think it makes a lot of sense, so I support that. Okay. Uh, well, okay, normally we only let you speak once, but I'll go ahead, Chris. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't identify myself last time. Chris Finney, Boulder Creek, um, and Director Fultz mentioned agendizing something, and um, so I had a question about that. Did we do number six on the agenda, the report of actions taken in closed session? Did I miss that? Yeah, she said there was one. Yeah, she said that. Ah, thank you. Okay, just, that was it. <laughs> I'm Tina Trogan, and I got to tell off before, so. Um, anyway, I just want to make a final comment that I um, I agree in sending the agenda item for the policy of the uh, stipend to the budget committee, but I'm also in support of keeping it at its current rate. Uh, Gina, on, I think we had a question here about the <coughs> committee members' <laughs> obligations under Form 700 and the Conflict of Interest Code. Um, right. So, do we have a resolution? Yes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just going to say this language in the board manual um, really won't have legal effect until and unless it gets put into the district conflict of interest code that gets approved by the county. So I would consider this language in the board manual to be essentially inoperable. So removing it for clarity yeah. is not a bad thing. I, yeah, I hate yeah. to have things around that are operable. Tendencies. And speaking of, I have another edit that I would suggest making on the same page. Okay. So the same page, page middle number 19, the one, two, three, fourth paragraph from the bottom conflicts with an earlier edit that has been made. It says the committee chairperson shall record summary minutes of each committee meeting. We've already talked about the board secretary yeah. conducted that. So that entire three line paragraph can be removed. The feeling is for a committee member to be taking the minutes. They can't pay attention to what's going on. It's 19. It's 30, 19, or 22. <laughs> Bingo. So the far left is the entire packet. That's the big, going to be the biggest number. And then each section, each little item is numbered in the middle section. That's what those are. And then sometimes they have other numbers on their own. So it's 30 for them and 19. So we so we strike the committee chairperson. Yeah. And we add in district secretary. <coughs> okay. That's yeah. Okay. 
Okay, uh, I've not, I've not made any edits regarding the stipends. Um, I know. So and it's going to go to the budget committee. Yeah, to the budget committee. Okay, to summarize the changes then that we have uh, made. Regardless of the start date, the terms of public members, the Administrative Budget, Finance, Engineering, Environmental Committee shall end on December 31st of each year. With the addition, board shall work with staff to describe committee appointment opportunities for, uh, for publication in October so that candidates can be appointed or reappointed in January. Mm -hmm. The change along peak oversight committee shall consist of five public members. Um, and the district secretary shall record summary minutes for each committee meeting. And the paragraph starting with committee members shall comply with obligation responsibilities. That whole paragraph has been stricken. That is the sum total of the change. Okay. <coughs> so can we make a motion? I think there are some additional members of the oh, board. Oh, there's more. I'm sorry, I'm not oh. aware of the line of sight. Um, yeah, I want to go back to um, you know, that one entry saying that you allow uh, no one to serve on more than um, as a standing member of, you know, as a public member on two standing committees. I mean, this is totally just disingenuous. You have somebody in mind for this. And you don't know that you're going to get more than three people to apply for the environmental committee. And if you don't, you're going to be um, eliminating one person to fill out the committee in the same form that you've allowed other committees to be formed. So if, if you don't want Jenny Gomez to be on any committee other than perhaps LADOC, because LADOC can barely get okay, um, people to apply to us, then you should say so. But not try to do this in a manner that puts something in place so that when the time comes that she's applying for it, that you know she's automatically rejected because of some clause in board policy manual. It's an ugly way to do this stuff. And you, you have stuff on your website, Ms. Henry, saying that you're going to restore trust to the district. And this is not a trustworthy matter. Way in uh, and you were really trustworthy. No, the personal attacks of members of the public are yeah. probably illegal under the uh, First Amendment. So you should probably I bring Gina said. in here if you're going to do that again. Uh, who's back there? Way in the back. Oh. Virgil uh, from Virgil. Uh, that comment was completely disingenuous, um, and we all know why. And that's but personal attack will you please? And that's cross don't be rude. Don't be rude. Just stop. Don't be rude. And I think more importantly, it's exactly stacking the committee with people that the board wants is something we need to avoid. And diversity unlike a lot of people who only give it lip service, is a way to combat that. And I view this as increasing the potential for diversity amongst our committees. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Glenn Lyons. I, I don't object to the idea of, of having one person only on one board. And the comments about specialization made sense. But just like in, say, affirmative action, you give preference. It seems to me you could certainly give preference to that policy without tying your hands. I don't understand the need for it. You can say our bias is we want to do that and go ahead and do it. Nobody's going to argue with it. But if what Chuck said came up, then you don't have that situation. So, it seems like a big fight about nothing. I don't quite get it. Thank you. All right. I think there's one more comment. Oh. Madam President? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think <clears throat> the board really has to weigh the equ equity issues and also the efficiency of these committees. We're not talking about board members. We're talking about the committee. They are appointed by and decided on based on their background as presented in their resumes. It's, there's no particular bias involved, in my opinion. You look at the resumes, you decide what is the best fit to fulfill the committee responsibility. 
Let's just try to keep it neutral and non-political, please. I think that's the way to be, to go forward in the future in a healthy manner. Thank you. Is that it for the public? Uh, okay. Yeah, real quick, just I, the part of this, um, you know, what, uh, but as for our, for our conversation before, I'm against uh, glyphosate, and that's my position, and I hope you respect that position. Um, so, and then part of the Jenny Gomez is, is serving, you know, um, it, personally, I would I would accept, you know, I would like her to actually rejoin the, um, the regardless on what position we take on if they serve on two committees or not. I would like to actually like to see her back on the committee. But before I was fighting for the my constituents that wanted to ban um, glyphosate, That's the only <coughs> reason why I you know I posted those things on. Okay. And I have the freedom to do that, and I hope you appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe want to modify that one line so that it says, rather than members of the public shall serve on no more than, that it read instead, the board shall have a preference for not... Um, Boy, I had that in mind. Oh, you can read right my now. mind. You, you can, can read, read my right mind. Now. No. Um, to, to go along with this gentleman's, gentleman's suggestion that the board shall have a preference that individuals not serve on multiple committees, but if qualified, may. Just on the idea that, you know, that the, the issue of specialization, <coughs> the issue of brand that compliance should all be taken into consideration, but should there come a circumstance where there are qualified candidates in few number and need for public committee members, then we have that option. <laughs> I'm good with it as it is, um, but I will defer to the rest of the board wants to put it in. I'm good with it the way it stands. Okay. okay um, Do we have a motion here? I would move adoption of, i get to it. Uh, Seven Rivers Water District Resolution Number 27-1819, uh, approval of Board Policy Manual 2019 with the changes that we have described earlier. Do you have a second? Second. Second. Holly, could you call for the vote? Yes. Director Swan? Yes. President Henry? Aye. Director Smallman? Aye. Director Pulse? Yes. Director Bruce? Yes. Thank you. Okay. So, <laughs> done with the old business. Um, the next business is uh, SLVWD um, and S uh, Scotts Valley Water District Joint Board Retreat, and um, it would be hosted by the boards of SLV and Scotts Valley and include the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. Uh, Rick? Chair, um, since this item has been in the uh Agenda. I've had conversation with the general manager of Scotts Valley Water, and the items kind of changed a little bit. Um, Scotts Valley, as of just today, has made the offer that Scotts Valley Water would like to host this meeting um, at their expense and limit it to the directors and management staff of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District and their directors and management staff, and not include the entire uh, the Sigma board. Um, they made a couple changes. Uh, on their request. Obviously it was too late to get it in the agenda. Um, so it would be paid for and hosted 100% by Scotts Valley Water and it would be the two boards and the management team. Um, it is a six hour um, retreat, uh, three hours uh, and then lunch and then another three hours. So it is a time commitment. But, is there um, a date? Uh, the, uh, we did kick a couple dates down. I should have wrote it down. The 28th of, uh, instead of the Sigma meeting, 
I, I did write it down. Um, somewhere I thought I did. But they did have a couple of proposed dates and they don't have them in front of me. Well, it did mention in here specifically the 28th, uh, which is a Thursday. 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 Oh, Two weeks already done. So that and that's the same day as the Santa Margarita. Water agency or no, no, I think it was different. Okay, there's two dates at the. Uh, no. Yeah, okay, March 25th is a Monday and March 27th is a Wednesday. Oh, okay. Uh, I'd just like to put in a request that, that this occurs on the week, weekend, mm -hmm. and um, if not, that it gets videotaped and the people that can go. March 25th and 27th. I won't be able to go That's what uh, I have here. Three hours and then lunch and then another three hours. It'll be a six hour total commitment. March 25th and March 27th. I think people, if it's a retreat, that prefer to have a retreat on a weekend. Did someone? I Very interesting. Now it's free for us, right? That's correct. The generosity of the Scotts Valley Water District. That's we, correct. We, very, very moving. What is the agenda? What is the objective? What's the goals? Six hours during a work day, and um, that, anything that's been proposed so far is a work day for, I think, uh, most of us. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not sure I understand. I mean, I went through the presentation, it was like, Group's bad, team's good. Okay. Correct. So it's team building to work together <laughs> is so it's a group segue in, in this, into um, uh, Sigma to work together as a question. team, to, to get to know one another. The districts in the past, we used to have more, an annual dinner with the two boards to try to open communications, and this will further do that. To work, it's to work as a team. Let's do it to get familiar, familiarity with each other, the board members, and spend some time and then uh, this facilitator will be there. Um, six hours, huh? I mean, yeah, it, it is a commitment. Made somebody in six hours. <laughs> <laughs> I like him after one and then retired. <laughs> <laughs> yes. the, the facilitator say That's correct. Dave? I'm not sure. No, I don't think it's Dave. No, I don't think it's Dave. Oh, so it's... Who's the facilitator? Uh, I'll, I'll get more information on it. But there'll be a facilitator there. It's, it's an actual... Program. It's an, uh, for me? A program. Yeah, it is. It's a full-on program. I mean, is, it, is, it, is it just the presentation that we, is attached in here? Is that, is I'm, that I'm pretty sure that's what it is, yes. That's what it is yeah. for six hours. The facilitators are a pair of <coughs> two people that come in and give this program. Yeah. Oh, and trying to get us. To work as a team. A group of. Uh, yeah. so, so, I mean, I'll, I'll echo what Bill said, at least from my perspective. During the weekday, six hours, not a weekend, we certainly could look at it. Or, why don't we just start out small? Maybe just do a dinner. That's, if, I mean, that makes some sense. Um, you know, open bar. I mean, <laughs> they're paying for it. Uh, you know, what the heck? No I mean, open bar. <laughs> um, I can definitely take back, you know, two that, That's my opinion. Uh, Scotts Valley, the Scotts Valley Board is very interested in, in, in meeting and, and working with the San Juan Valley Board. And they're working together as a team. Because we do have a common problem. I, I think it was, it's a good idea to get together. Um, that we're going to try to uh, solve as a, as a group. So, as I'm weekend. hearing it right, we prefer a weekend. We're interested, but prefer a weekend. Saturday. I would, like to, I would like to start just for the weekend. You'd like to start just with a general. Like they, yeah. I mean, that's a great idea, Rick. If they used to do, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it has to be noticed as a public meeting. Of course. Yeah, and it has to be in one of our districts and and noticed as yeah, a public meeting. Absolutely. Does that mean anybody that shows up, Scott Scottsdale is going to pay for dinner? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> haven't in the past. I was wondering the same thing. I was going to say, come on down. Start with the dinner. All that and, money. Come on. And see if we can cut it, cut the time limit in half. Yeah, I mean, it started six, ended nine, or something like that. And no bar? No <laughs> bar. Salad bar. <laughs> no okay. bar. All right, sounds good. I'll take that back. Okay, so that's that. Right. Public, public comment? Yeah. Okay. Public comment. Oh.
Anybody want to, in the public, comment on us partying? <laughs> Debbie? Yeah. Um, I think it's a great idea for a dinner, too. And, and I agree, the six-hour commitment seems like you know, a pretty heavy start-off. <laughs> but in the end of your agenda are, is a, an attachment that has a lot of education and training for board members on, from CSDA, I believe it is. And yeah. those look really good. And I'm sorry that's not an agenda item, because I'd love for you guys to get committed to something like that. That's hands-on training on how to be a board member and all the things that you're facing here and budgets and and infrastructure and everything is covered under that kind of training and mm -hmm. if the district's going to commit time to something I'd prefer something like that. That's a good They're both yes. good. <laughs> Any other comments? So we're going to move on to the um, SLVWD Water Supply Outlook and Environmental Department Workshop. And by the way, board members, you do not have to wait till the end of the presentation to ask questions. Okay. Jen, uh, would you like to yeah. introduce your presentation? Yes, please. I am just having a little, I, I came in here early so I wouldn't have technical difficulty and now I'm having technical difficulties. Chris, what's that funny laptop with Apple? You don't, you don't like those? Chris, could you get one of the lights? Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. It's okay, it's okay. I didn't have to, I think I have to restart my computer. I've already done it twice. It's not coming up. So I'm so sorry, but it'll just take me a second. I have to, I'm not sure why. Maybe it signed off. It logged off. It's lost I don't you know choose why. a Wi-Fi network again. Yeah, choose again. I did. Uh -oh. Just give me a second. Apple hates Cisco. Apple hates Cisco. I've never had this problem before. And of course, I've been I've been sitting here for an hour and so, so thinking it was going to be fun. Only one of them is good. Only one of them is good. <laughs> <laughs> So just, you're just you're on something. Okay. You're not choosing one. Or? I, I'm just, give me a second. Just okay. Give me a second. I'm rebooting my computer because. Uh, okay. I'm so sorry. Great photos. Beautiful photos. <laughs> I don't know why. This has to happen. It just happened. I've never seen one that goes right. I even came in so early so I could make sure it was working fine at 4.30. <laughs> <laughs> they always go. So they go. Aren't they? Well, um, I'll, I'll start just while I'm rebooting here. Um, you all have had plenty of time to see those little blue and green cards that were on your chairs. There are pencils over on the table if you don't have one. Um, the blue card is for the first half of my presentation, which is going to be on water supply. The green card is for the second half of the presentation, which is on the, water, the environmental department um, update. And so... Um, if you could, um, after the presentations are, are over, you can please answer those questions. If you have any other questions or comments that come up while I'm doing the presentation, please write them on the back. I do want to get your, your comments and thoughts um, after the presentation is over. If we don't have time to get everyone, or if you think of something and then you maybe don't think of it while well, it's during the question time. So. Um, I have also printed out copies of this, what Margaret likes to call the Spreadsheet of Special Magnificence, which is a uh, matrix of all the activities that are going on in the department, in the environmental department. And, um, and those are, and we're up, good. <laughs> um, so this, these are mostly sort of generally in, in the same 
it should flow with the presentation for the most part, so you can kind of refer back to that. Um, and then... 0683. Thanks. <coughs> and voila. And voila. Right. And this work now. Okay, good. Great. Okay. So, we'll get started. Where are you? Are you there? Okay, here you are. So this is going to be quite a long presentation. Um, I do have um, stop natural stopping points through the presentation that where I'll I'll be asking for questions, and if um, if it's okay with you, Chair, if we can hold the questions until we get to the end of each section. There's many sections that I've kind of broken it up so people will have a chance to hear the whole presentation for that section, and then they can ask questions about that. If that's okay with you. That's okay with the board members. Um, I don't know. They're not broken out like that. It's more content driven. Okay. So. We'll give it a shot for the first one. So, um, we're going to start with uh, long range water supply planning, and we'll talk about regular regulatory compliance and how this, um, how our long range water supply planning is the framework for that. A regulatory framework for that. We'll talk about the water conservation that comes out of the regulatory requirements from the state and what we're doing in our water conservation efforts. We'll talk about the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and briefly about the Sustainable um, <coughs> Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency. And, um, and then we'll talk about conjunctive use planning and implementation. And then for the second half of the presentation, we'll talk about the environmental department, the stewardship efforts that we have, capital improvement, permitting, land use, um, land management and environmental stewardship, disaster planning and response, and then we are also responsible for all the communications and public engagement and the stewardship activities um, of the financial resources, so like grant funding and administration that we are doing and, uh, and networking and, um, and getting more work done with through partnerships and collaborations that we could do than we could do just if we were doing it on our own. So we'll get started with the water supply planning section and um, I'm going to start with a, an introduction to the geology of the water system, talk about water supply challenges, again the regulatory framework and then we've been doing a, a stream flow and temperature study for the last few years and also I'll kind of summarize that and what we've learned from that experience from that um, study. And then now we're moving into a conjunctive use planning effort. So, um, and then we'll talk about the next steps. Sorry, just conjunctive use, that means sharing water amongst all the various systems in our network. Yes, and so we'll talk more detail about that when we get there. So the San Lorenzo Valley, where are we? Here we are, sorry, here we are. The, um, the San Lorenzo Valley is a really unique area because we have a very complex geology. We have granite um, on Ben Lomond Mountain. We have karst in the south, and then we have a granite geology up towards the north part of the Ben Lomond Mountain, which you can see here um, in yellow. This is the, or in, over here actually in the purple is the schist. So where are we here? You want to look at it? Reorient. Reorient. <laughs> yeah, please, Vanna. <laughs> um, here's Felton, and here's the Ben Loman Fault, and this is where the San Lorenzo River runs. And then over here on this on this yellow side is the Scotts Valley area, and we have you can see a lot of sandstone from the Santa Margarita outcropping here and here, and um, and then over here on the on the west side of the valley we have the um, more of a granite, right? This gray area is more granitic, and we have schist and marble, which is more the karst feature. So it's a really complex geology, and it changes from you know one mile to the next as you move through the valley. Most most um, areas will just have um, sort of a 
a very homogenous geology with like an alluvial plain or something. So you're not having all of this very complex geology. Um, because we have this very complex geology, we also have a very complex water system. And so this is a flow chart which nobody could ever understand, but I only put it up there to kind of demonstrate the complexity of our water system. We have, um, and I'll just briefly talk you through it, but this area here is for Felton, and the Felton system is a standalone system. They're, they're operating from surface water only. This up here demonstrates the north system. And that area, it includes all the way from north of Boulder Creek all the way down to Ben Lomond. And that system is operating in the winter on surface water flows and in the summer on groundwater flows. So that's what we call conjunctive use. And we've been doing that since 77, I believe. And um, it's really been beneficial to um, maintaining our water supply in the groundwater air wells for that system. Lompico is now part of the North System, so they're being served by the North System. Um, we have a water right to Loch Lomond, which is demonstrated up there, but it's not being used. And then down here we have the South System, which is the Pasatiempo Wells, and you'll find those down near the Probation Center off of Graham Hill Road. And so we serve an area of Scotts Valley right along Mount Hermon Road, all the all the all the businesses and, um, and houses that are on the west side of Mount Hermon Road. So all the way back to Graham Hill Road, our service area covers all of that area. So these three systems are really operating separately from each other and, um, and they all have separate water supply sources as well. So we have to look at all of these systems and try to manage the water sustainably. Um, so System-wide, about 50% of our water use comes from groundwater. 50% of the water comes from surface water. That's not exactly that much every year. It's really, we're really rainfall dependent. So if we have a really heavy rainfall year, we'll get a lot more surface water that year and less groundwater. We'll use less groundwater. If we have a period of drought where we're, our streams are really flowing low, have low stream flow and it's not adequate to serve our whole north system, then we'll use more um, groundwater that year. So it's really dependent on the north system because of the conjunctive use. But in general, you can kind of ballpark it and say it's about 50-50 in a normal year. Um, <clears throat> so we have um, our, I, I may have already said some of this. So some of our, so it's really a benefit for us to have such a diversified water portfolio, to have um, these surface water sources are really, uh, we're really fortunate to have those surface water sources and to have groundwater sources so that we can balance those sources. Um, one of the great things about serving this community is that people in this community already are very water conscious. We have about 43 gallons per capita per day, which is extremely low state for a, on a statewide standard. And um, California is much lower than most other states in the country. So um, we have a lot of water supply challenges, though. We're not, we're not totally in the clear. We do have a nice water, uh, diversified water portfolio, but there's a lot we can do to make our system a lot more resilient um, for the next long drought period that we will certainly um, experience. And so now, this year, we're, we're having a lot of rain, which is great. We're right around average for uh, average rainfall. And so that's great. It gives us a little more time to kind of get our ducks in a row and get ready for the next period of drought that, that may start any time. We just don't know when, right? So we got we to gotta get ready on it. Um, so there's a, there's a recently, over the last, um, over the years, we have been seeing an increased variability in precipitation and stream flow. And our groundwater supplies in the south system are overdrafted, and I think everyone here knows that. And our groundwater supplies in the north system, um, while they are in sustainability, during long periods of drought, during 2015, those, those wells were strained to meet the demand of the, of the north system. 
um, it was it was to the point where we were just barely able to get enough water into the storage tanks so that when the weekend was over that there would be just the tanks were nearly empty so it was like we were pretty hard on the edge during the drought because those and those groundwater wells were pumping constantly our surface water sources had completely almost completely dried up to the point where our, our treatment plant was having to be um, operated manually and our groundwater wells were just barely um, maintaining the supply that we needed to be able to serve our customers during the late summer period so it was a it, it was kind of eye-opening for for the district and I and so we started um, looking at how we can improve our sustainability on our water sources. Um, the, the Felton system, as, as um, many people know, has been out of compliance on its water right since um, long before it came to the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Um, that water right is tied to the San Lorenzo River, and when the river gets to a certain flow regime in um, October and November and the water right specifies exactly how much CFS is in the river and if it drops below that CFS which is a cubic foot per second then um, we our water right says we don't have the right to take any water from Fall Creek and Fall Creek is the only is the, is the main um, water source for the town of Felton so if we were to obey that water right then then water would be turned off in Felton so obviously that's not an option, so we need to figure out how we can um, um, come into compliance on that on that water source in Felton. Um, and then we have a lot of deferred maintenance that's been um, becoming more and more of an issue with um, leaky leaky pipes and a lot of leaky tanks, and we have undersized pipelines for fire flow and we have undersized pipelines to resolve all of our water supply challenges if we were just to try to move water around through um, conjunctive use from the North system to alleviate Fall Creek. It, like, it's not so simple. Everything is very complex. And the more you look into it, it gets more and more complex. So, um, so some of our water supply challenges. Um, another big problem for us or could be a big problem for us is if we have a catastrophic fire in the San Lorenzo Valley if it um, burns Ben Lomond Mountain that will impact our water supply our surface water supply for a long period of time it could be years um, so we need to prepare for that and we need to have you know we need to have fire personnel familiar with our lands um, Touring, touring them annually for fire personnel change so um, we're, we're working on a fire management plan now but we are at risk for our surface water supplies um, in case of fire and we also uh, have an increased frequency of flooding events in 2017 was one of the, the highest stream flow or rip, um, precipitation on record and the district experienced significant damage during that that year and we and you can see right here is um our lion tank i think it's a three million gallon tank um and so there was a massive slide at the lion tank just below the lion tank and it took out the road and so um the field crew were having to manually carry the supplies up the hill to get to the treatment plant and um and we haven't figured this one out yet. This one's still a problem. We, we're working on the engineering. It's, it's a tricky one. It's, so um, being prepared for, for these kinds of emergencies, and then also we have to respond to these kinds of emergencies, which takes a lot more staff time away from the regular duties. Um, just responding and, and working with FEMA and getting, you know, trying to get reimbursement so we don't have to pay for all of it ourselves and trying to keep the costs down for the customers. That's really important to us and we've been doing that. Um, so here's a picture of the stream of the variability of our precipitation and you can see um, how, how it goes off the charts high and then down low and about 100,000 um, acre feet per year right here is about average so you can see it's always either like 
way below average or way above average. And, um, and so these present challenges for us in managing our water supply. This is a, a graphic image for you to see how the Pasatiempo well has performed over the t life, lifetime of, its, of the wells. So it started up here at really high, and initially it just dropped off really <coughs> precipitously. This line right here represents the screens in the well. I was going to bring a screen to show you. Um, when the water drops in the screen below, when the water in the well drops below the screen, it starts to rust and um, oxidize the screen and then you have problems getting the water to come into the well so you have infrastructure problems so um, not only is this showing that the that the groundwater has been overdrafted significantly it also is causing problems with our infrastructure is that the one that's been replaced yeah it is actually that one has it's on like the last chapter yeah. of being replaced yeah, it's almost so possibly like, is replacing that that's right. And the other one, I think, is Paso 6. Was that one rehabbed? No, I don't know. They're not watching. <clears throat> okay, this is the Olympia well field. Um, and this also just shows that the, that the water level is below the screen there. Um, but I, I, didn't, I didn't find a good graph that demonstrates that the Olympia well field is actually kind of in sustainability. For groundwater, in order to be in sustainability, um, ideally, you would have, you know, an average rainfall year annually, and you and it would be spread out through the year. You would pump the water down in the summer, and then in the winter it would rain, and it would just re refill the aquifer. And then you would pump it down in the summer, and it would refill. And so annually, you would have sort of this up and down of the water level, um, and that would be in sustainability. And when you, when we have these catastrophic rain events a lot of that water ends up running off into the river and it's not able to soak in. When you have all these, this, all this rain happen in a narrow period of time, we're losing a lot of recharge. So we're not getting that water level to come back up in, this, in the winters. And when we have, you know, obviously no rainfall then the same, same problem. So it does tend to start going down. But we've been operating the, the Olympia well field for a long time in sustainability and it's looking good, it's, except for um, the capacity, the storage capacity is a problem and, um, and getting enough water out of those wells to serve the community. So, um, I think I'll probably cover this a little bit later, but I did mention it already that Fall Creek is out of compliance in October, November, and um, the Felton, <coughs> um, the North system really has not enough unused potential from the diversions, so we, it has no unused potential from the diversions, which means our surface water diversions are fully used. We treat the water, we just supply it to the North system, and that's like, especially in the summertime, that's all we, we use it all for the North system. In the winter, there's some excess flow, and then there's some playroom there, some leeway with the surface water in the winter when there's more surface, in a wet year, and we can treat that water and then move it through the pipeline, then there's, you know, there's some percentage that we can alleviate, that we, anyway, conjunctive use can work, but it's not enough to really get Fall Creek out in compliance. So I think the point here is that using water conjunctively and taking water from the North system is not enough to get Felton into compliance. Mm -hmm. So we need something else in addition to or instead of. Um, hey, that's my take. <laughs> is that your take? <laughs> Are you in the South system? Well, we have, we have above. Oh, okay. Looks like that. <laughs> All right, so deferred maintenance. Um, I'm, I'm kind of, I think I jumped ahead a little bit earlier, but we have insufficient storage during severe drought. We have compliance issues, overdrafted. We already went through these. Um, so now we're going to start with a regulatory framework. Uh, at, during the drought in 2015, the state of California started rolling out a California Water Action Plan. And um, 2016, there was an executive order that um, uh, that 
basically directed water suppliers that they would have to implement these water supply um, um, plans. Okay, and then we also have the Urban Water Management Plan and the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, and then um, we have some bypass flows issues that are coming up on Fall Creek as well. So I just wanted to give you an outline there, and we'll talk more about the framework. Um, so three, there's four sections of the California Water Action Plan, making California, or conservation, a California way of life is what their slogan is using water more wisely, eliminating water use, <coughs> water waste, um, strengthening local drought resistance, and improved agriculture use. I'm not going to go over the agricultural as aspect because it doesn't really apply to us. But um, what it means for us would mean that, in, that we'll have to update our water shortage emergency ordinance. Our current ordinance has a lot of, like, in stage two, you're not allowed to wash your car without a shutoff valve, or you're not allowed to um, spray your sidewalks off, and these kinds of, during certain stage of emergency, there's these water waste restrictions. But this, this new um, state requirement will say that these, those identified in our different stages will have to become permanent um, prohibitions in the, for the district, we'll have to make our own ordinance that says you're not allowed to do these things ever, and then there'll be additional um, um, regulatory requirements with the drought, with the different stages. I'm not sure exactly what that will look like yet, but we will have to change our ordinance. Um, so currently we are meeting our water use targets for, that we had identified in the 2015 Urban Water Management Plan. And there will be a new water use target methodology for the 2020, which hasn't been developed yet, or the guidelines haven't been published yet, but there will be a new methodology for that. Um, and we will need, we, we are already now reporting uh, water use and amount of water conservation achieved and any enforcement efforts. So that's something that already rolled out and we're already doing that, so. Um, so, water suppliers will have to complete a validated water audit, water loss audit annually, which we're doing now, we've done for the last two years. Um, and the state should be having some funding programs for water saving devices and technologies. So there might be some opportunities for us to get the state to pay for rebate programs to put out to the customers. Excuse me, the water loss audit, mm -hmm. is that the loss that, if, for example, the supplier is losing on yes. their own? Yes, the leaky leaky tanks exactly, stuff? leaky tanks and pipes. Yes. Can we get money for that? Maybe, I haven't I mean, seen that yet. You know, the, for the water conservation in individual homes, important. Mm -hmm. But the big kicker, if yes. we're losing 20 to 25 percent of our water production yes. to leaks, which I think is what I've heard before, 17, whatever yeah, it is. Not quite that much. But, but, but it's, whatever it's, it's, it is, it's high. It's significant. It's high. Significant. It's so high. We're get money there, I think there is going to be funding coming out for water districts like ours to get um, help with infrastructure improvements. I was talking to the foundation of Santa Cruz County recently, and they were saying that that's that they're expecting that to come out pretty soon. And that might be an opportunity for us, which I'll get into later, um, to look into the integrated regional water management effort. And I'll be updating that plan soon. Do you know off the top of your head when that's happening? Well, there's not a big update that's coming right now. It's, it's a fairly small update just to bring in the compliance with the current regulations. Okay. So we are soliciting projects. So mm -hmm. we can add additional projects to that plan mm -hmm. almost any time. Um, okay, so the next part of the state's California Water Action Plan is um, strengthening local drought resilience. Sorry, what, is, what does that mean? It means uh, we need to make ourselves more drought resilient. What does that mean? Short of storage, what does that mean? 
I will get to that. That's what I really want. To know. Uh, we're all we're working towards that, and I and I think I'll I'll answer your question is, soon. Is it taking people's water consumption down to twenty gallons a day? I, mean, I don't think so. I, just, I, I think it's more supplier oriented. I don't think so. We're we're doing really good with our water conservation. I don't think it's going to be getting the customers to conserve much more than they're already doing. Hey, we need to get to 50, which means we need to start selling more water. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll have to do a drought risk assessment every five years, and we'll have to do a annual water budget forecast. Um, these will have to be reported in our urban water management plan, which will be due in 2021. And if we're not in compliance, then that means that we will not be eligible for grant funding for infrastructure, for water conservation, for... Can we get funding for staffing to support all this regulatory stuff? <laughs> I don't think that's one of them. <laughs> um, our recent water leak, which will come out next, which you guys will get, uh, we had a water leak report, and it will be on the agenda in March. Um, or is it second February? Second one in February. We had 40 leaks, and it was 120 gallons per minute system wide, and that was 206 acre feet. So we made a fun graphic to show what six acre feet would look like, <laughs> about the height of a of a redwood tree across the entire SLV high school football field. And these are 100%. <laughs> these are 100% of the leaks in our system. No. That's no, what. No. That's no. Found. So there's more money. Uh, yeah. there. This this was the leak detection that we did. The subsonic leak detection that was that we had a professional come in that weren't surfacing. They were found right. underground. Yeah. We fix a lot more leaks than that. You'll see that report in next board meeting. Yeah, which you'll get coming up when we get into the operations presentation. We can stop overdrafting a lot just by exactly just, just by fixing the leaks. leaks. Just by <laughs> fixing the leaks. <laughs> So this is a timeline, just to, just kind of, you don't have to see too much about this, but it um, just kind of shows you that there's going to be quite a few more rules coming out by mid-2020. Unfunded mandates. We need to, I mean, I hope CSDA is basically saying, guys, you got all these mandates coming, start funding them. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And they need to be making that a shower at the top of their lungs. Yep. Uh, and Mr. Stone needs to help us with this as well. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, urban water management plans. I just wanted to mention that an urban water supplier is a supplier either a publicly or privately owned, serving more than 3,000 customers. And San Lorenzo Valley Water District supplies 7,900 customers, so we are an urban water manage manager supplier. There's no density requirement on this? I mean, come on, 3,000 subscribers in <laughs> California is different than 3,000 subscribers in... I, I don't make the rules, water. I'm just delivering the message. <laughs> okay. Urban. Yeah, we're not we're urban, urban, but we are an urban water supplier. Um, these are some of the demand management measures that we are currently doing. Um, this is a whole list of all of the demand management. So in the urban water management plan, it has a, a whole section dedicated to demand management measures, which is how we can get our water supply or water consumption down. And so we are um, doing all of these things, and these aren't all in my department, but throughout the departments. Um, with the ordinance, we did the, a water waste ordinance we have, we're replacing meters. All of our, all of our customers are metered, and we are replacing those meters. Um, we changed the rate to promote conservation. We have uh, annual water quality reports. We have monthly billing cycle. I'm not, I'm going to speak through these pretty quickly. Um, we're doing a new, we're going to be updating our Web website, hopefully getting more conservation um, information out through that, social media. We do Water Conservation Coalition of Santa Cruz County, which is a wonderful opportunity for us to really pool resources with all the purveyors. We'll talk more about that later. If we're at 43 gallons per capita, what, oh, is, the goal, what is the goal for conservation? At what point do we continue to squeeze people down? How, what is the end goal that we want to get to? I think we just want to maintain people 
to understand where we are and keep and maintain the conservation where we're at. I don't think we're trying to squeeze people down any further at this point. So we're, we're kind of good. Mm -hmm. um, we've been doing direct mailers, advertising in local papers. We have booths at many events throughout the um, district and in other areas. We um, are quantifying non-revenue water losses and system of the leak detection that we talked about. We're replacing faulty water meters and um, and now we're doing a when customers have a high use and we all investigate it and we'll work with the customers to try to help them get their water use down and we'll look look to, we'll even go and do a, a water audit on their property to see if they have a leak. I have another question. So we're at 43 gallons per capita. If we have another draft would we put in place a 20% reduction as required by law? It would be very much um, dependent on the drought. Or, or I can't it, really say. <laughs> or, or would it be based on a earlier baseline usage? Earlier baseline. Yeah, 2013. Yeah. 2013. That's what it was last time. Baseline is. The new, there's this. But could this, they change that to make it baseline as of 2013? So what it said was in 2020 at the Urban Water Management Plan that we would have to. Um, that they were going to roll out a new methodology for for having a much more instead of just saying 20 percent from 2013 and having that blanket across the state this new methodology is going to be more site site specific to allow water agencies to really work with their own numbers and actually come up with a number that makes sense for us instead of just doing the same thing as everyone in the state so that's what they're doing at the state <coughs> So we do the watershed education. Oh, and then, so this is um, the schools and the public education we're doing a lot of, or not a lot, but we do some outreach there. We do the, the, the majority of our school, working with our schools is through the watershed education grants. So most of our, um, we're not working with the schools on a regular basis. We do go and do presentations occasionally, but most of our water conservation and watershed education through the schools is done through our grant program. Um, we also participate with the Water Conservation Coalition and we, we have a couple of um, partnerships that we work with the Green Gardener and the Cabrillo College to fund gray water workshops and remove your lawn kind of workshops and other ways to get um, water conservation. Are any of those programs co-sponsored by the county? Yes, Valley. they're all co-sponsored through the Water Conservation Coalition, which is all the water purveyors in Santa Cruz County. And so we're all putting in, um, relative to our the number of connections that we have, we put in um, it's funds. Not matching funds. It's prorated based on the number of customers you have. Exactly. That's how we're doing it, mm -hmm. based on the number of customers. So the city puts in a lot more than we do because they have a lot more customers, connections. All right. Um, I kind of want to get through this because we're getting it's been 30 minutes. Not so bad. Okay. Feels like longer. <laughs> um, we have our rebate program. We have our water survey and that I just mentioned. And um, we have water conservation devices that we give out, like hose nozzles <coughs> and, um, and sink aerators <coughs> and shower aerators and things like that. So I was asked to give some numbers. Our water conservation program budget, I estimate this year will be looking like about $30,000 in total, $15,000 for the rebate program, $9,000 for the conservation outreach. Um, the, the Water Conservation Coalition last year was $5,500. We haven't done the budget yet for this year, so I'm not sure what that will look like. And. Um, we have the audit, water audit program, which is in-house, and the conservation education in schools, which is also in-house. So we don't, we don't have to pay anything. <coughs> but it's your time. Just our time, yeah. All right. So, um, and then, so moving on, we'll talk briefly about the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. I'm going to have a, st a stopping point just in a couple more slides for questions. Um, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, we 
have so much going on with the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency and we have meetings every month and we are doing this series called Understanding Our Water and I think I think most of you are going to those um, but if you haven't been there's another one coming up this weekend and uh, it's not going to be the same content as last time it'll be from 9 to 1 at the Felton Community Hall and then there'll be another one a third one in March and they're all building on each other so um, it's not that you're missing it's not that you can't understand where it, anyway you should just come <laughs> yeah. um, so the Santa Mar uh, the, the sustainable groundwater management act gives authorities to local agencies to form a sustainable a groundwater sustainability agency and so we did that and we formed the Santa Margarita groundwater agency which is a partnership um, a collabor a joint powers of authority between the county of Santa Cruz San Scotts Valley Water District Santa Cruz or San, San Lorenzo Valley Water District are all the member agencies and then there's a sec second tier with the city of Santa Cruz the Mount Hermon um, and the um, city of Scotts Valley and the private well owners um, we're working towards writing a, ground, a sustainable groundwater management plan which is um, will be submitted by 2022 so we have a couple more years but we have a lot of work to do and so we're trying we're moving forward with that at a pretty pretty quick pace the um, it was formed into at the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency was formed in 2017 and in 2018 we put together all of the administrative documents and kind of put put all of the legal portions of it together and um, just at the end of the last year we finished the existing groundwater model evaluation which is where we're really starting to look at the hydrology of the region and uh, they we had it evaluated and there were some recommendations for how that model needs to be improved in order to look at all the priorities for this for, that we've identified or that the, that that agency has identified to um, come to sustainability we haven't um, not we but the agency hasn't hasn't really defined what sustainability looks like or what it will be because that's something in the state law that says it's up to each community to define sustainability for yourself and so that hasn't happened yet um, so there's still a lot of opportunity to participate with that agency and um, and and be heard as far as what your feelings or what you think sustainability should look like um, in 20 it's like Right now, we're working, or the, the agency is working on hiring a new uh, uh, consultant to modify the existing model, groundwater model, and write the plan. And so that will be the next phase that we'll be moving into this year. Um, so far, you know, we're engaging the public. We've had really good turnout at the first workshop, and we're trying to get public input and um, really try to engage the public with that process. Um, so the total cost to develop the groundwater sustainability plan will be two million dollars. One million of that's been grant funded and then we've broken it up that San Lorenzo Valley would pay 30 percent, Scotch Valley will pay 60 percent, and the county will pay 10 percent. And so the total cost to, to develop a plan for the San Lorenzo Valley is three hundred thousand dollars for us for the whole for the whole plan, and that will be broken up over the years until twenty twenty two. So that's not one year. That's not a one time payment. Um, okay. Uh, just on the on the payment side of that, is that the the agency itself has the ability to create and levy. Fees is that where this money is going to come from? I mean, why wouldn't why that is has this? not been decided? Okay. Would come out of the plan, I think. Currently, it just comes out of the SOB budget. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. You'll see over three hundred thousand. Are there any other questions? Okay. 
Um, south is wells only, so no conjunctive use between surface water and wells. Correct. Uh, or excuse me. Um, south, south is um, does have south. Yes. We have an entire time of Graham Hill Road that feeds in surface water. Well, I thought can. that was for emergencies. Right. Okay, I'm talking about just regular yeah, cell just strictly right. yeah. For emergencies. So there is a pipeline. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. I understand that. They're, they're we're we're moving that direction with regulatory requirements to make that pipeline be able to be utilized. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk okay, more about that. that that's, that's actually an interesting question because right now my understanding is the state water rates basically prohibit that. No. Felton and from Felton, Creek. yes, but not from Boulder Creek. So we can ship water out of Boulder Creek That's under, the, under our water rights anywhere we want. That's correct. That's cool. Well, though we don't have any capacity right now. Right. Um, is the, and then Felton is surface only, and North is surface and ground. What's the split in North between ground and surface? It's about 50-50. Okay, so basically everything's roughly so 50 in the south. <coughs> the offsets Felton, and everything's good. Approximately. Um, it depends. It's very dependent on the year, right? Forty-three gallons per per day. Is that common through all three systems, or is one system more? No, than that's an average on the whole do system. Do we have to break down by system? We do, but I don't have that for you right now. You can almost figure double in the Scotts Valley area okay. from the north system. You know, you look at the, the topography and the sandy soils and and the lawns. lawns. There are a lot greater users in the south system. Okay. When we say overdraft at Fall Creek, we mean we're in violation of our water right. Yeah, I didn't mean to say overdraft on Fall Creek. Okay. Yes, we are. Um, well, there's a lot of good stuff here, and I wish we'd had it a little earlier so we could have more questions. I'm not but done we, yet. We will have more. <laughs> there's <another> more. <laughs> but wait, there's more. But wait. <laughs> I'm going to try to. Yes. So. <laughs> We need to start using mock loam. Seems pretty obvious to me. No question. And I've actually talked to Rick about this. He thinks it wouldn't be that difficult. So I don't know why we aren't going that way. I think we should. Well, we will be. I mean, it's going to be the money is what's going to be the right. biggest hurdle in the lock loam. Lock loam is our only. Is our only other water source that's available. It's a contractual right. We have right. 300 plus, a little better than 300 plus acre feet a year. And so I'll probably get into that. I'm going to get into, into that. Into that slide, what's available at Lock Loan. Including what it would cost us to purchase it. Well, I don't. Oh, no. We're we're just Lock Loan? It. Well, no, we have a contract. We, we, we have a year. Yeah, we have. Th there's a price for, for raw water, and it's a negotiated price with the city of Santa Cruz mm -hmm. way back. For treated water. For, no, you know, for raw water. Raw we, do not, we do not have a negotiated price for treated water. And the water needs to be piped to the Kirby. Well, it needs to be treated. Yeah. Yes, it's got to be treated. Okay. That's That's all well, we're going to talk about all that. Yeah, good. Okay. Good. Are you ready to move on? Okay. Anything, Anything else? Okay. Yes. Yeah. You briefly talked about groundwater recharge, but it sounds like it was more of a passive um, rainwater drainage. Do we have any specific plans to be more active with groundwater recharge? I'll talk so about that. Okay, great. <clears throat> okay. So I'm um, just going to briefly, I'm not going to briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing brief Nothing's that. really brief. Um, it's infinite complexity. So um, we'll talk about the, oh, I first wanted to mention, I think now's a good time to mention that we have a memorandum of understanding with the county, the city of Santa Cruz, and Scotts Valley Water Department to explore conjunctive use and to manage our water resources sustainably. And this was, um, and then we'll talk about the stream flow and temp study that we've been undergoing for the last five years. And then we'll talk about conjunctive, we'll go into more detail on conjunctive use. So, um, the agreement is available on our website, the Memorandum of Agreement. It's under uh, water supply in the public documents. It's buried. But um, hopefully when we redo our website, things will be easier to find. Mm -hmm. um, 
It, I just put a couple of the bullets here so you could just see, a, get a flavor of what that agreement looks like. But it basically says that we're gonna put to get, we're gonna be working together on a plan to look at conjunctive use, and um, and to improve sustainability of water resources in our whole Santa Margarita region, right? Um, so I, that's all I'm gonna say about that. I just wanted to mention that that's out there and it's available on our website and you guys can is look banking into it. the same as aquifer storage in your interpretation? Yeah, so banking it would be pumping it yeah. into the ground and storing it like a bank and then using it in the summer when it's dry. Right. We have yeah. no above ground storage. Right, exactly. So this one. Limited, yeah. Right. Okay, so uh, in 2014 we began a uh, study on stream flow, temperature, and related observations in the San Lorenzo Valley Water District surface water sources of community water supply. Can I briefly mention that we didn't exactly volunteer no. to do this? We I'm going to get there. Told. Yeah. So in 2014, California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the National <laughs> Marine Fisheries Service were concerned about the San Lorenzo Valley Water District's diversions and their impact on fish habitat. And so we were told that we need to look more closely at that. And so, um, and so we entered into a contract with the Balance Hydrologics to initiate a comprehensive study to quantify stream impacts of surface diversions on stream flow and temperature in the main stem of the San Lorenzo River. And if we didn't do it, what was the or what the state was offering? I believe that the or what would be that we would have to do a habitat conservation plan, which would have cost a lot and been years of agony. Do we know that? I wasn't there actually for that. Do you know what that or what was? Well, I'm from the state, it, we're here to help. It, it, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of background on why it even came up. It came up with the consolidation of uh, Olympia Mutual. Uh, through the uh, environmental impact report study, uh, the, uh, several of the, of the uh, fishery agencies commented on the district's water use and sent us a letter that said it's time that you either do your habitat conservation plan or, or uh, that they're going to start looking at enforcement for bypass flows and we need to establish those. So it was uh, Either you need to do something to show your water use, <clears throat> or we're going to tell you what to do. So it was kind of, we went along kicking and screaming, but said we would do it. Even though we're 43 gallons per day? We, we, we weren't then. No, we weren't. Yeah, Santa Cruz was already going through the same exercise with on their north coast. Um, then they started looking at San Lorenzo Valley as the next bigger, uh, the biggest user in the San Lorenzo River watershed. So they really didn't have any really good idea how much water we were using, how much water we were bypassing, or what effects it had <coughs> on uh, the tributaries and the San Lorenzo. So that's how it started, to gather information. And that's what we've been doing, gathering information. Right, and we'll talk about the findings. Um, so we uh, we were monitoring um, the one of the cool things that happened that we didn't know was going to happen, but we ended up monitoring during 2014 and 15, one of the driest periods on record, and 2017, one of the wettest periods on record, and then 2016 and this year 2000 or in last year 2017 were pretty average years, and so we got a really nice, um, you know, <coughs> variety or you know variability in stream flow, and able to really monitor that and see what that looks like, and and what does that mean for our water system and our watershed as a whole, and how does it work? So initially, we installed 12 gauges in 2013 and 14. Um, I'll, I'll describe those in a little more detail in a second. In 2015, we discontinued three Clear, Clear Creek stations and replaced them with real-time stations, which means you can go online and see what the um, bypass flow 
is at any time. Um, we are required to have a 30 gallons per minute bypass flow. Right. We have we have a, con uh, we have a contractual easement with a homeowner to bypass 30 gallons a minute um, at all times on Clear Creek. And the reason we put a continuous monitor and gauge in there because it was almost daily that we'd have to go up and measure the flow because the homeowner called us and said, you know, I'm not getting my 30 gallons a minute. We'd have to go up and measure, bucket stopwatch type thing. So we finally put in the technologies change. The uh, communications was much better up in the Third Creek Canyon. So we put a continuous monitor and gauge. So which that equipment saved a lot of hours and staff time by not having to go up there and maintain that 30 gallons a minute flow. We could do it all by computer. Um, and then in 2017, during the flood, the Foreman Creek gauge was buried in boulders. And so we moved it upstream of Highway 236, so that just changed the location. Um, we installed a real-time gauge on Fall Creek diversion, and that reports to the SCADA system, so we can watch that at all times. We can keep an eye on that. And we had been doing daily monitoring of that as well yeah, before. When we took over Fall Creek from, uh, from Cal Am, <coughs> that equipment was already in, and it was damaged uh, two years ago in the flooding, and so that was an actual FEMA replacement paid to replace the equipment on Fall Creek. But we're required to monitor Fall Creek continuous because of the bypass flows. And Fall Creek is our one stream that we have that really produces some water, and, has a, and, and we do have significant bypass, does have fish in it. Um, that we monitor closely. So um, currently, or up until recently, we had 10 operable gauges on nine creeks, plus uh, plus we monitor the USGS great gauge at Big Trees, which is really the, the primary one that most people use in the area. Okay, so, um, this is, this is maybe too much information. I'm going to go with the map <laughs> just to make it easier and more fun to look at. Um, it's, so you can see up here in Boulder Creek, what we were doing was up off of Boulder Creek, we have multiple diversions, and we, were, we put in gauges on the stream, and then we put gauges, and then we were monitoring the stream flow upstream of our diversion and downstream of our diversion so that we would understand how it impacted the total flow in Boulder Creek. Boulder Creek is a salmon or a steelhead stream, and so we are looking at those. Um, <coughs> our, our, all of our surface water diversions that flow to the San Lorenzo River, they're actually not passable for, to fish except for Fall Creek. And so we're really looking more at how, our, how the stream water that would come down those tributaries into the San Lorenzo, how would that impact uh, the total flow in the San Lorenzo River and the temperature, because the temperature is critical for the health of the fish. And so we were, we were doing that on um, way up at the top. You have Peavine, Foreman, down here is Clear Creek and Sweetwater. And each of these triangle <coughs> red things are, are the gauges that we had installed. We're also monitoring up on Lompico Creek and Zianni Creek, as well as um, upstream and downstream of Fall Creek and the Bull Creek um, stream at, at, the, at the confluence with the river. And this is kind of what the, um, the this is what the monitoring was took in. So they were they were getting an estimate of the flow, the inflow at the stream, and then they were we were we did during this project we put in meters on the diversions here. They weren't formally metered, um, and then 
they were mon then they were calculating all of this sort of bypass that was happening. There were leaks underneath the weirs. This is what one of our diversions looks like. There was leaks coming in through the concrete and leaks coming in subsurface and they all kind of join up onto into the stream and they were measuring how much water was still flowing down that stream and looking at um, how that impacted the total flow in the either Boulder Creek or San Lorenzo River. So, um, so some of the key findings, and this is a positive, is that even under drought conditions during 2014, um, the diversion quantities were much less than the flow in the main stem of the San Lorenzo River. Um, and that the points are really, that the diversion points are very far from the river. And so even though, so since our diversions are so high on the watershed, the water gets diverted from the surface water flow, but there's still subsurface water coming down that stream bed. And so it doesn't, it's not dry, even if we divert 100% of the water there, it's not really dry for very long because the water comes underground and it perks back out and then it starts flowing again in the stream. And so that was one thing that we were finding is that um, what we were diverting is, is so much less than what the total flow is in the San Lorenzo River. So we kind of we kind of knew that anyway. This was just where we have to spend a lot of money to prove what we already did. We just have to have data, right? So we have a lot of data. And um, diversions are much less, um, both as a, okay, well, let's just skip to the important one, sorry. The, ad the adverse effects of the diversions on temperature are <coughs> slight in most places within the main stem used by a steelhead or coho. So that was, uh, that was interesting. So the most, I think it depends on the, if it's Fall Creek. Fall Creek might be an uh, exception. But so what happened, what we found is that um, as the stream flow, okay, so we did, a sh we did this um, shut, off, shut off test. So we had shut off our surface water diversions and let the stream flow back down into the river. And then we monitored the stream flow in the stream and the stream flow in the river and the stream and the temperature as well. And we found that the temperature is really more um, affected by ambient air temperatures and less by our... Um, Diversions. Which also makes sense. I mean, we, right. we would kind of know that too, just mm -hmm. by physics. common sense and mm -hmm. physics exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not. I mean, the, no. the streams are much cooler sometimes than the. They're so small. But they're so small. They're small. Exactly. Yeah. So. And so that's what's going to do. Exactly. Okay, so we're two for two. <laughs> Here's a cool one. Um, one thing that we found was that so we have the Ben Lomond Mountain here. And here's the, the topographic peak of the mountain. But our recharge, recharge is happening over here in Bonnie Dune as well, up by Empire Grade, on the back end of the peak. And so um, it's not just the water that falls in our watershed that we're benefiting from, from for water supply. We're also benefiting from the recharge that happens in, in the Bonnie Dune area. Through karst. Mm -hmm. Exactly. All right, and then I'm, I'm afraid to say these out loud because they are pretty obvious. <laughs> um, so I'll skip a couple. The base flow in the uh, higher tributary it was high, obviously, in 2017. But um, one of the things that we found was that even after a normal year in 2016 and then a gonzo year in 2017, um, the base flow didn't really recover back to what we had would expect it to be at a, like a normal base flow. Um, that's due to the extreme drought that we experienced and also um, the, the narrow period with which the rainfall fell in. So it didn't really get to recharge into those, um, into that area as much as it would if it had been spread out through the year. Um, 
the water temperatures at all the sites were remained below 20 degrees, which is good for fish, and recharge is still happening in the watershed, although 2017 was such a wet year. Uh, the karst hydrology provided more sustained flows in the summer than other um, geology, geologic features in the valley. And um, the last four years on average roughly presented the long-term average at the USGS Big Trees gauge. So those the, those dry years combined with those wet years really kind of all averaged out to be about an average period. Um, so this is one of the findings that was pretty interesting. So we have the way our system works is where during the summertime pumping groundwater from the Zianti area, Quail Hollow County Park, that's where our wells are for the North System. There and we pump we pump the water from the ground there and we move it way up into the valley. So way up past North Boulder Creek. And those and so by pumping the water back up into the valley upstream that and everybody's on a septic system and those and you know most many septic systems are functioning properly some of them are not this does have water quality implications but it means that the base flow in the upper watershed is being benefited by the way that we're operating our water system because we're moving water from the south part of the system and putting it up into the north part of the system and that actually contributes to base flow so that's a, um, a so habitat what, what benefit. What is the estimate of that gets returned? Is it 50% we kind of Oh, yeah, I'm not even 50%. I thought about 50% of the water that we pull out and goes through septic tanks goes back to the stream flow. So, so again, kind of we would want instinctively to have yeah. that. So that is a good thing for us. Yeah, that's a good thing. But so we I, would hope that it's, uh, I would hope that the water in the leach fields would eventually get down into the uh, aquifer. That's kind of a common sense thing again. And the difference is evapotranspiration in the trees, yeah. and yes. stuff. Your ground, what your ground type is. What Soil type. All that yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But I mean, eventually, some water is going to get back down. For Either it gets so into the aquifer or goes into the sense, but a lot of people don't know. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> when you when you once you say it, it's like, oh Apparently yeah, that makes sense. Making us do this. Well, the rate for agency fish and wildlife. This is the formative. That's that's a unique concept to them. Mm -hmm. What is that last pool of green, Jim? Um, yeah, that San Lorenzo Valley Water District, most most water purveyors are not moving water up into a watershed. Okay. Most are moving it down. And most are so. sewered, too. Yeah. And most are yeah. sewered. And if, yeah, if this had been sewered, then it would significantly impact the base flow Correct. on the river. Mm -hmm. Or if it was a step where you're bringing it all to a common location, but that might actually have some advantages in terms of being Okay. So, um, what we would like to do moving forward would be to suspend um, the operation of the Bull Creek and Bennett Creek gauges. Uh, we'd like to suspend the operation of the late summer stream gauges on Boulder Creek, Clear Creek, and Fall Creek. How much was this costing a year? It was about a hundred. Was it with the temperature as well? It was like one hundred and eighty thousand. Yeah, that's a significant number. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to um, <clears throat> suspend the temperature monitoring and reduce the monitoring in the seasonal gauges from from May to October on Foreman. Just to seasonal gauges, so we're not doing it year round, just seasonally. And we'd like to maintain the Lompico Creek gauge as a year-round gauge for at least two more years um, until a Lompico forbe forbearance agreement can be negotiated. So because we may decide to look at our <coughs> Fall Creek water right and change that, if that would be something that you would have to make a decision about. If you choose to do that, it would, it would be wise to have data to show what we're maybe willing to trade something for the Lompico surface water right that we have and if we're you know we may want to
because the Lompico is a really valuable water supply, um, water source for, for fish. And so the fish agencies are more interested in keeping water in the Zyani and Lompico um, watershed than maybe in others. So there could be something like that worked out. I'm not saying that that will happen. I'm just <coughs> saying it's an option. Um, Um, I'm, I'm almost done. <laughs> um, and then we'll, we'll continue to work with uh, Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency in the county to help fund some of the other monitoring that we had been doing. And they'll, they'll maybe take some of that over for the funding those portions. So we've already talked to them about that. And seem amicable. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so the outcome here is that we met with all the resource agencies in November, and we ta we've, been ta we've been meeting with them annually and um, dis discussing our results and, from this study. And, and when the last I talked to NIMFS, he said, yeah, I, I'm not going to be pursuing your habitat conservation or enforcement on you. It looks like you guys are doing going in the right direction, and so they seem to be quite happy with what's going on for now. Um, so I think that's valuable for, for the district. And, um, and then the next thing we'll have to do is, is um, negotiating the bypass flow for Fall Creek. And we'll have to do a um, pre-1914, we'll have to do stream, we'll have to do a um, We'll have to get permits from the Cal state of California for bypass flows on our pre-1914 water rights. That's something that they've not started enforcing us to do, but that's something that's coming down the pike. So how many years did we do all that measurement? Four years. So that's like... 800 and some thousand dollars. for that. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's, that's, I mean, for 8,000 subscribers... <laughs> Uh, well, let's just say it's eight hundred thousand dollars, but by eight thousand, it's a lot of money mm -hmm. for each subscriber. Yep. You know, that that's a burden. That is an overhead burden that is enormous. It yeah. is expensive, but there's more that comes out of that. So, all that data that we collected over the last four years um, will has been used for the next section that we're going to talk about. So let's talk about some questions from this last section and see if anyone has questions and then we'll talk about conjunctive use and how we're going to use that data. So on your, when you're talking about negotiating the pre, or Fall Creek and pre-1914, that means going back to the state and saying, we don't like the water right we have, we want something different. Is that what you mean by that, on that last slide? Yes. Bypass. So we would go back to them and say, we want to change our water right mm -hmm. from 100 years ago. Maybe. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure. Well, I would say that's what our direction would be. I'll, 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 <laughs> I don't think there's a maybe about it. You know, yeah. Santa Cruz is looking to change uh, their, uh, on their water rights on the San Lorenzo River, which may impact the amount of water that crosses the Big Trees Gauge, which is directly reflects on what we take out of Fall Creek. Our, Permit, um, you know, requires us to monitor the, the the big trees gauge, and that's what tells us when we can withdraw when we can't. So I would say yes, we would want to go back and, and renegotiate our our bypass flows. So there, there's two parts to that. First, Santa Cruz has wanted to up that or change their water rate. Then that action is impacting us. That is, Could. if they weren't doing Could. that, would we be making these changes? I would say yes, because fall. Felton has never really been in compliance. You know, it wasn't just Cal Am, it's not just us, it goes way back. I'm not sure when they were ever really in compliance. You know, maybe a wet year, a real good wet year, they were in compliance. Um, but that's, you know, very hard not to, to get that system in compliance. Some people can say we should just use our Loch Lomond allotment. But, you know, personally, I disagree with that because that's not solving that problem. It's bringing that, that you know, that, that's bringing water that we need to solve all of our drought problems in the San Jose Valley Water District, not just Falcons. Well, well but I, 
I, mean, I think we should table that for yeah, a definitely. It's a, it's a whole discussion. Because is is there any danger? I mean, I know when you so for example, when we remodeled our house, we did a fairly large remodel, and uh, basically you have to bring everything up to code right, mm -hmm. to do that, which can be very expensive. If we open the water rights up for that kind of renegotiation, are we going to get in that same kind of exactly? And, well. That has yeah. implications for the district and for budget sure. and money and is the state going to impose other restrictions if we just left it as is, it would be harder for them to do that. Not impossible because of course they can do whatever they want, but harder for them to do that. So, so that's what I'm worried about. I would say that's definitely something to be <clears throat> concerned about and it's something that, that we need to look into. I, at this point, we haven't looked into it yet. We don't know what that's really going to look like yet, but that's the next step. Really. So we're getting water from our home. It's like, you know, we don't have to open things up. No, but I, I think there's concerns with all of that. And I think they're going to look at the bypass flows regardless of what, because we're not in compliance. Are we, and are we not in compliance the entire year? Or no, it's just certain months? times of the month. A certain time of the year, a couple times. Generally two months. Yeah. November. Now, on a wet year, we we're, can, good. we're probably pretty well. Yeah. That's correct. I, I have some prepared comments on the conjunctive use plan from the engineer's perspective. Oh, we, we're not on the conjunctive use plan. I know, use so yet. I was going to just wait until you get finished. Okay, great. That. Can you, yeah. Sure. Yeah, great, great. Do you have an idea how, how much longer, Jen? Um, I am um, like two thirds to three quarters. I have like probably another half an hour. This, this is really good stuff, though, by the way, so okay. I'm perfectly happy to take the time. This is a little picky, but I just want to see if I have my math right. There's 8,000 connections, mm -hmm. and it ran for four years, and it cost $300,000? 800000 800000 Okay. Yeah. I thought, that doesn't seem that much, but 800000 is Maybe 300000 would be a lot. 300000 comes out to $9 per connection a year. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, but now it's $25. Per connection per year. More or less. Thanks for doing the Most time. Most time. Yeah. Um, the regulatory agencies that are asking us to do these things, the, the stream flow monitoring, are they in a position to point us in the direction of any possible grant funding from their agency or from others? And would there be a, an opportunity to, you know, Say, could you put in a good word for us? Here are the things we've identified that you think are potential mitigations or solutions against future impacts. Can you point us at some pockets of money? If they're not being forthcoming about defraying the costs of unfunded manda problem. mandates, do if, they have other resources? If we're volunteering to pick it up, why would they volunteer someone else? Well, no, we would have to apply for grants right. if they were available. Um, I, you know, I, my, my day job is trying to figure these things out, and mm -hmm. I'm, I don't have a lot of free time to be looking at through Prop 1 grant opportunities. We do partner with other agencies who may have some more bandwidth for that, and um, I, we do work with the foundation, and, and definitely they have staff that are pouring through these grant opportunities all the time, and so... We are communicating with those people to do that, yeah. And we have only recently, I mean, only in the last three years have we even been eligible for grants because we didn't have an urban water management plan done until 2015 or 16, yeah, it was late, yeah. so. So, and we have already received two grants since then, so, yeah. Okay. Okay, more questions. Yeah, just quickly, a quick comment on the Lompico water rights having been from, coming from Lompico and going through the merger. This was a major issue for many of us in Lompico, the value of those water rights, not taking the water upstream, protecting the fish because it is a, a, a it's got a, a classification as being studied and it's an important fish habitat. For sure. So for many of us, this was a big deal mm -hmm. that you could leverage those water rights to take them further downstream, as far downstream as possible, mm -hmm. to say that the district has decided to not use the water 
for obvious economic reasons, to use those rights right now. So the value of them may be diminishing because if you go to Fish and Wildlife and say, well, we want to leverage this, they're, aren't they going to just turn around and say, going back, the original plan was to leave Lompico on that water source for five years. That all changed. <coughs> so now we're looking at none of that water is being taken out. The value might be dropping. Is there any way to put that leverage to use sooner rather than later? Because aren't they going to just say, well, you're not using it anyway, so there's no advantage there. You lost your leverage. Well, in conversations we've had, in verbal conversations we've had, they will not transfer or credit one water right for another. Um, well, well, you know, we've talked to them and said, hey, we won't, we'd like to take more water out of Fall Creek and not here in Lampico. They, they don't look at that as something that's viable that they would transfer the Lampico right. What we no sooner took over Lampico, even before we had cow, fish, and wildlife, and, and, and uh, no fisheries tell us that, you know, hey, Lampico has not been in compliance. There have been compliance orders against Lampico about uh, taking too much water out of the creek, and they weren't going to allow that with San Lorenzo Valley. They were going to enforce that. Um, you know, we looked at Lumpico Creek. There, it, it, it wasn't an, you know, uh, an economical um, decision not to use it because there just isn't enough water there. And that's, you know, one of the reasons you all merged was for a, a more reliable water supply. Um, you know, they know that we want to do something with that water right, and they want us to leave it in there. So I think it's more goodwill than anything. Uh, you know, the value is more goodwill with them. They're not going to transfer or give you credit, so to speak. Yeah, I know it wasn't across the board, but right. from my memory is they were very interested in that use of stopping. Well, as, definitely. As part of the merger, definitely. they were very encouraging. They were threatening enforcement at, at time of the merger. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but it didn't have a value, and I'm wondering if the value is going away. I would say no, because yeah, say the, no. the Zayani Creek has been identified as one of the most important streams in the yeah. lowest uh, for coho recovery yeah. and so Lompico is one of the main tributaries for Zyani. I think it's a, a, a critical stream for fish habitat. Mm -hmm. Okay, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah Jim. Uh, this is a very complex Gordia knot we're going to be dealing with the next couple of years. There's a lot of moving parts uh -huh. The calculation, the calculations are going to be, the calculus is incredible. And uh, my concern is, one, we shouldn't be making these decisions strictly from a bean counter point of view. I'm concerned about the future changing of water rights that are growth inducing, particularly with a minority member on Spinkwalk. I'm referring to the city of Santa Cruz, who really is this backbench vote we should not be allowing the tail to be directing the dog here. Mm -hmm. We're going to sacrifice fish and environment as soon as we change those water rights with the city of Santa Cruz being the major beneficiary as well as Scott Valley through conjunctive use. The real <coughs> issue here is growth management and that is not being addressed and it should be uh, inside the environmental impact reporting system on each of these projects. I question the issue of $100,000 for eight meters, or how many meters that you have, which are, are uh, for, for flow meters that you have on each of the rivers, which are necessary for collecting data. And uh, I don't see how you can just completely subtract those out and, and when one fell swoop. I think there needs to be more analysis. I've looked at the conjunctive use plan for the last couple of days. I find it, if we haven't even come to this yet in the next agenda item, I find it woefully inadequate. A lot of fluff, a lot of uh, speculation. Sure, there's some nice graphs and everything, but if you look at the, the final conclusions on the report that's coming up, it needs a lot of work, and I, I would recommend that we do not even a, approve it tonight. So we've got a major, major problem here facing us. And when we got into bed with SMIGWA, which was required by the state, the counties involved, the city of Scotts Valley and San Lorenzo Valley Water District. What's really driving it, though, 
is real estate growth in the coastal communities. We need to all be aware of that. More water that's allocated, sure we make money. Sure we'll make money as we reduce our usage. We should be using additional water resources from Loch Lomond. We should not be giving away our valuable resources, particularly during drought years. Let's no, be realistic. That's not on the that's not on the table. Giving I, away water during the drought is not not something even. Well, you know, I just think that there's a lot of issues here that are politically motivated and also market driven, and I think we need to really look seriously at what the uh, what the decisions that we're making here over the next two years and how it affects us locally. I know we're a fixed population. The big 800 pound gorilla is on the coast and they're going to continue yeah, asking for additional down. water rights. We aren't going to vote on anything tonight. I nope. understand. There's nothing. I'm just making some We're comments. just talking about a, managing our water supply sustainably. Yeah. Okay. But it's, so, it's, 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 it's your poor question, your poor to answer is too simplistic. It's a lot more complicated than that. Oh, I and we all think know I it. said it's in, infinitely complex. Yeah. So <laughs> I think I, I, I preface many this presentation with that. Re impact report meetings where we can dissect the EIRs and at our uh, environmental committees. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So with that, we'll move into the conjunctive use um, portion of of our water supply outlook. Um, so uh, in 2017, we received a grant from the Wildlife Conservation Board um, in partnership with the County of Santa Cruz to... I'm sorry, is that the state one? It is, yeah. Um, to look at our water supply and how we can manage our water supply more sustainably. And the, um, the grant award was for $330,000. The scheduled completion is December 2019, which makes me nervous. <laughs> um, so the main goals or objectives was to look at potential stream diversions in excess of system demand, potentially available for transfer to other systems. So north system stream diversions, if, to look and see if there's excess stream diversion. Big high water flows can go someplace else sometimes. Exactly. And that, that could also include, in, are you saying to South Valley? To our, I would say initially to our own south system, which yep. is Right. I think good. initially, I mean, I would recommend that the board try to first make this district whole before, but um, but looking at what is what opportunities there are at the same time. So is this the same three hundred and thirty thousand that we can reduce our two hundred and eighty-five thousand dollars? Stuff, or is this a different 330,000? I don't, we've only had. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's, about a match, it, it's the thing that's, it's the next item on the agenda. Right. Okay, well, I'll, I'll talk about the match because I actually didn't put the match in here. So I, I will <clears> talk <throat> about that. Um, so when you receive a grant, usually the, the grantor, the grantor, wants to see that the grantee has some skin in the game. So they want to see you already doing stuff in, in, that will support whatever they're helping you to fund. And so we used the stream flow monitoring funds from the last year or two um, to, as match funds and also some infrastructure things that we already had projected, like we used the, um, we redid the pipeline from Bull Creek down to the treatment plant. We used that as match funds. So we're not coming up with new projects just to match the funds. We're using the funds that we've already spent and allocated and have already spent as the match funds. So how much money is that? We, we agreed to 285000 I think is what you said. I think that's about right. I looked at it the other day. 
Um, and we, I think we've already submitted it. So, you know, we've proven that we are, we are yeah, working we towards it. We've spent the money and we've already submitted it to the Wildlife Conservation Board and they're going to be re reimbursing us for the funds that we have been spending on this conjunctive use effort. So they'll reimburse us the $330,000 or, or some portion of that because there's some staff time and there's other things that come in there too. It sounds like we did way over 285 if we had two years at 180 and then the well there was like a time limitation so we we were awarded the grant on a certain date and then we could only use the funds that were spent you know from that time so yeah, the, all of, yeah all of 18 and three quarters of nine, uh, 17. right so the board voted to accept this in was it March 17. or something of 2018. 17. Uh, or maybe it was August of um, of 17 was when it was finally oh, uh, administrated. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we'd be way over. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that comes out. Mm -hmm. That works. Mm -hmm. um, so. We, were, we looked at the percent of unimpaired flows remaining downstream of the diversions. We looked at normally sustainable groundwater yields and reduced yields during drought and heavy demand because we wanted to make sure that if we're, use, if we're looking at using groundwater to, um, to move to other areas that we're taking into account what the normal sustainable groundwater yields are and and uh, how that is diminished during drought. And then the, um, the system capacity limitations, pipes, how much water can we move, how much water can we treat from the surface water treatment plants. And so we had to look at all these, all these components of our system in, in great detail. And so um, Nick Johnson, who's been our hydrogeologist for 30 years? 30 years? Um, 30 years. <laughs> uh, did, did a, basically he made a, a, a model of our system and was able to evaluate these with great detail. Um, the three main goals are to bring this, the Felton system into compliance on its water rights to achieve sustainable north and south system production, and to improve base flows for fish habitat in the San Lorenzo. Um, the potential for the, he looked at the potential for the San Lorenzo Valley Water District's Loch Lomond allotment, and for aquifer storage and recovery, which is pumping the water down into the ground for storage. Um, and then, <coughs> And then he looked at the potential for additional Scotts Valley area inlet recharge. So inlet recharge means if we're delivering water to, say, the South System, for example, if you're taking surface water in the winter, delivering that to South System so that they don't have to pump their water, then you're actually banking that water for the winter instead of pumping it out. So that's called inlet recharge. <coughs> Um, so there are four scenarios that he looked at. One would be expanding conjunctive use with the system inner ties, the use of Loch Lomond, uh, the aquifer storage and recovery, and the inland recharge again. So I put that in twice, sorry. Um, I think it's important to note that these, that this assessment had, had limitations, that it, this is a, a model. It's not, they're not, um, these, these haven't been directly measured, so these data points are from a model and are not like, as accurate as it would be if you were out there in the field measuring these things. And so the results, he said, um, shouldn't be used to evaluate compliance with a specific regulatory water right or habitat requirements, but it should get you in the right direction for, to help you make decisions about how you want to manage your water supply. Normal yes. disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
So, the, the ultimately what we found what we found is that a supplemental source would be needed 20% of the time to comply with the Felton water rights. So that two months of the year is about 20% of the time that the Felton water system is out of compliance. Um, complying with the Felton water system water rights would notably increase the minimum flows remaining downstream, um, particularly in Bull Creek, because we divert pretty much all of Bull Creek. Um, the South System imports of unused potential diversions would allow 30 to 50 to greater than 50 percent reductions in the South System production. So if we were to move water from, say, the North System into the South System from with wet year surface water when we have sufficient water supply to provide all the water to the north system and anything in excess of that during a wet year if we moved it down to the south system we could reduce the pumping on the south system wells by 30 to 50 percent. So, sorry to jump ahead to the next slide a little bit. When I was reading through the report it seemed like that was not feasible the vast majority of the times in terms right. of using the north system to do anything because the north system right now is in balance. What exactly. So we could only do that in like during really wet years. Would we be able to do it during this kind of year, an average year? I don't know that, but I can look into that for you. Mm -hmm. It's determined more like by the peak flows. So if you have mm -hmm. a particularly high peak flow for a storm or two, mm -hmm. you could divert that chunk of the peak. The peak flows are usually turbid and not really the best water quality. quality. No. So mm -hmm. it's not the peak flows, it's when the base flows have come up enough that there's excess stream flow in the base flow. It would be interesting because what I took away from the report is that except for like one year out of ten or whatever, mm -hmm. it, you're not going to be able to do that. Right. Um, but I could be reading it wrong. Yeah, it just depends on what we get. You know. So this is also with the understanding that as of right now, other than emergencies, we can't use the intertides at all. So we would have to declare an emergency in order to do this. Right. And the emergency would be, hey, we need to stop overdrafting in the south system, therefore we're going to do this. I don't think that would be yeah. under, under the intertides when we install them, that wouldn't be an emergency. Yeah, I know. Would, I'm just it, why I was asking. The definition of an emergency to use the intertides are a mechanical failure, not a drought or a lack of water supply. Mm -hmm. We would do it, but it's pretty uh, defined as you know short-lived mechanical <coughs> emergency power outage, those type of things. I'm asking for but that we just need to do the environmental background and, and move ahead on, on, on doing the environmental work to get the inner ties to be used. And you know, how much does that cost? I don't know. We have that number. We don't have that number. Yeah, you know, those inner ties. Our our funds were approved. With a caveat that you know we have good news and bad news. The good news is we've got your money for these inner ties from the state, but the bad news is you've got to have them in in a very short period of time because it was at the tail end of the grant. Um, we didn't have the time to do the environmental work, so that's how we got around the short timeline for getting them in was we use them for emergency use only, and then come back after they were in and do the environmental background. Yeah. You know, when, I don't, when I went in, I don't know that we, as a district, communicated that two-step process to the public at the time. Um, I think it was emergency only, and that's mm -hmm. all we're ever going to use. So this would be a change. In that. Yeah. Um, this would be a change. A significant one. Yeah. yeah. And, and so. The plan before, yeah. Yep. And so this this conjunctive use grant does fund um, the CEQA for the pipeline to use the pipeline outside of emergency. So the permitting, the environmental review. This is the re this is basically the first step of the environmental review for CEQA. So the 330,000 plus our 285 would fund this. There is budget for funding, you know, part of the CEQA. If it depends on how much it comes out to be, but yeah, there's there are funds for that. We'll dive into that more during the budget process yeah, for sure. Yeah, probably. <laughs> um, okay, supplementing the north system with Felton system, now this would require a, a water right change because 
the Felton water right specifically says no water from Felton can be moved outside of the town of Felton. So in order to move water from the Felton, like if we had excess stream flow, now we're never talking about dry weather, you know, sharing water. We're talking about wet winters when there's excess stream flow, adequate enough to meet fish flows first, and then meeting the town's needs second, and then if there's anything in excess then, we would be looking at moving that. That's, that's the only time that we would, so it's a limited time that we could do that, but even if you can move water to try to alleviate some of these aquifer overdraft in those, in those narrow windows that can be beneficial to um, actually base flow in the stream. So if you're leaving water in the, in the aquifer, moving water and supplying it to areas that would be using groundwater or um, putting it into the aquifer, then you would actually get more base flow into the stream, which would also benefit fish habitat. So there, are, it's it's like very connected. So, so the fountain is split right now in that way. And I think the reason I was asking about Boulder Creek is it says here state and federal fish and wildlife agencies may impose limitations on North System's pre-1914 water rights to divert surface water. So that was in the report that they came up with. So I took that to mean that there might be some limitations on our ability to move north water south yeah. to either Felton or Scott. There's no limitations on the, the north system surface water. There's no limitations on the Loch Lomond water either. No, well, I understand that. Part. Yeah. That's why it's so attractive. Yeah, the only place we have limitations Felton. is in Felton. And that's mm -hmm. in the permit. Felton's permit is very unique. Yeah, so why did they put that line in? There. You might want to ask him. So, um, can you write, can you make a note? Can you make a note to that? I'm happy to be your scribe. <laughs> can you be my scribe, please? <laughs> well, I'll probably pass that one down. Take that one All down. All right. Thanks. So. Um, I'll be recording. So, and then a note is that stream diversions for Inley Recharge and ASR, which is the Aquifer storage recovery, where you pump the water down into the aquifer, occur during high flow periods, I just said this, and have relatively little effect on minimum flows remaining downstream of the diversions because it's during the periods when we have high flows, right? I just want to reiterate that because I heard, you know, I've heard people say like moving water in the summer when there's not enough water and that's not on the table. We're just talking about that narrow window when there's high flows. When you see all that water going over the Boulder Creek, going under, you go, God, that's just not helping fish at all. <laughs> exactly. Right. Okay. Um, the use of Loch Lomond allotment allows Felton to comply with the water rights and the South System to reduce groundwater pumping by 60 to 70 percent, making unused diversions available for ASR. So, the Loch Lomond could be very beneficial. It's definitely a high priority. Um, supplementing the North system with extractions from ASR provides 30 to 60 percent net reductions in the North system groundwater pumping. A Do we know what an ASR system costs? No, but I would imagine that would be a shared cost. Right? We wouldn't do that by ourselves. Well, I would hope not, but it's still <laughs> the same thing. Uh, not so for maintenance, though. Maintenance is a lot higher. Than this pipeline. A lot more energy, a lot more, energy, yeah, a lot more maintenance, and a lot more we, pipelines. We need to move along here. Yes. Because we are, I'm going to have to eliminate the last item on our agenda, because there's no way. Okay. All right, so um, with that, I will move along. And estimated increases in water production with assumed increases in diversion capacity for potential increased yields from, okay, moving on, moving on, moving on. I don't know how to go faster through this. I think these are all important points, but if you, were, if you did read the report, it was provided in the agenda. Um, all of these conclusions are in that report. And if the board were to accept it, I could put it onto the website for people to look at at their leisure. Um, 
but that's the next item on the agenda, which may not happen. <laughs> okay, so the next steps. Um, the next step for this effort will be to complete the fish assessment. We are meeting with the fish biologist next week to look at um, what that's starting to look like. We don't have that assessment available yet. I will bring it to the board when, when it's ready. And then uh, we will want to assess the bypass flow requirements for the north system diversions and the Fall Creek adjudicated water right, which I've mentioned several times with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and Fishing Game to look at bypass flows for fish habitat. Um, we're going to need to do CEQA on intertie pipelines and evaluate feasibility and cost to bring Loch Lomond into the system, consider operating opening the Felton system water rights, whether or not we want to do that, and um, consider conjunctive use agreement for ASR with Scotts Valley in lieu recharge for, to sustainably manage the groundwater in, in that area. We are on a shared aquifer down there, so we do pump the same water from our south system as Scotts Valley does. I think we need to have an agenda item on the water rights stuff at some point soon. Um, okay, so there's here's some costs, upcoming costs I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, so our longtime hydrogeologist took a job elsewhere uh, and will not be available for consulting for us anymore. So we, it would be very wise for us to get a new hydrogeologist under contract for the district to help us with our effort with the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency to help us with our conjunctive use um, efforts and, and the many things that we do here. So I'll be bringing, um, well, we'll be doing a, I assume we'll be, I, I expect that we'll be doing an RFP for that soon, I, depending on direction from the board. Um, and, uh, and then the, um, Refined hydrogeological monitoring for stream flow would be um, also a contract that we'll be bringing to the board for, for approval. So, okay. We had a lot of questions there in the middle. I was hoping to hold them off to the end. Thanks, Bill. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah I, like I said earlier, I had sort of a pair of things. I studied the conjunctive use plan mm -hmm. all today and I spent all the day. Cool. So I want to take out some of the things in order to save time. Okay, right. To kind of, to, I think it's really important to, for the public to really know what's going on here. And again, this this report that's on the next thing is basically an assemblage of data for water. And I just want to clarify exactly what water that we are talking about. We're ta we are talking about 313 acre feet from Loch Lomond. And we're talking about water from diversions from all the various streams, up to almost double, actually, at certain times. It all depends on water rights. Um, it, oh, that's what all the, those tables in the report are all about. They show you, okay, you can take X amount of water out of Small Creek at X amount of times. Da, da, da. So, um, so it's a, it's important for people to. Be aware of all this stuff so that you're involved with, and you you can see how much how we're spending money, do, you know, how we're required to do these studies, etc. Um, I don't want to go. And um, again, the big problem was Felton, because it's Felton. There's three different areas, like you said, Felton. So it's all surface water. The south area, which is all groundwater, and then the north area, Boulder Creek, which is both surface and groundwater. Um, again, I think you can appreciate my position. I've always been, you know, I'm concerned about spending the, the public's money efficiently, so I'm always concerned about um, seeing studies done that don't really help to move the ball forward. So, I, you know, but I'm critical that I always want the public to know exactly what's going on and what this could lead, possibly lead to. Um, yeah, because uh, you heard me complain about the urban 
planning study as an engineer I, that data is useful but I can I can get that data easily I don't need to spend money to do it urban because this is really an urban that so all I'm saying I understand you need to do it to get a grant I understand that I get it so that's that's fine um, but the important thing that I'd like to say is it should be really patently obvious that Loch Lomond is not large enough to supply water for this county. It's only 9,000 acre feet. I come from Marin County with the same amount of people and they have over 80,000 acre feet of water storage from reservoirs. This county has something against building reservoirs. I don't know why. Um, so the, city, the, count, the uh, city can drain Loch Lomond at any time from 3,200 to 5,600 acre feet. They can literally almost drain it by half if they want to. They have that water rights. And yes, we have that right for 313 things. And we've all seen it. You know, it closes down one drought year, it closes. And when you go into a drought, well, guess what? Your SOL, it's not, it's not a thing. It's not a large enough reservoir to supply this thing. We need more reservoirs. So you're going to hear me lead into my ideas about things. My, I, I just want to say that these, these ideas of building reservoirs in the San Cordy should need to be put onto the table. They should not be ignored. They should be put onto the table so that people can see cost-benefit analysis of having those put into the, the thing. And then, to, you know, because if you allow government to stick with their plan, what they think the best, which is this conjunctive use plan. That's going to push forward and that's the only thing that we're going to see. You might never see the plan that might be better building reservoirs in the San Okay. Okay. I, uh, I know, I know we went a little bit over in time so I want to be quick with this. And, but I spent, all, I really spent all day um, talking about this. So the report shows if, um, that the, this district needs 2,340 acre feet per year. And that's actually 265 gallons per connection divided by the 7,900. Um, and there's a reason, obviously that's a high number because there's fire flow, there's flushing the water, there's a lot of water and it leaks, whatever. So anyway, that, this report is calling for 265 gallons per <clears throat> um, the 313 feet of acre feet that comes out of Loch Lomond, um, obviously the pipe needs to be built from the raw water line that goes up to Loch Lomond and go over to Kirby Water Treatment Plant, and that's how much that's going to cost to do that. Uh, but again, you know, I would rather see that pipe connected to a sand quarry reservoir because I don't believe Loch Lomond is large enough. <clears throat> um, the impact on the fish is debatable. Um, it's highly debatable. We're just at, we're basically the important thing you need to understand about the fish is that that there's a certain water flow at big trees that's down below the level. All surface water is cut off, and that's basically to protect the fish from getting wiped out. From you know, there's just not enough water at all. But this, the conjunctive use plan is going to take a substantial amount of surface water, uh, it almost double perhaps, from going into the river. So with the San Quarry Reservoirs, you don't have to worry about doing any of that. You don't have to worry about it affecting the fish habitat. I like to think of the fish habitat as real, fish real estate, basically. With more water, you got more fish or water to. And we really want to, we want to, a step, we want to reestablish the fish habitat. That's that's the goal here. We want to see a we want to see a, a goal. So that's another plus for um, to to go to the the San Quarry Reservoir plan. But there's a reason for this, and you indicated it later that the reason why there, you, we want to collect water from these clear water stream canyons is it's clean and it doesn't really need to be treated. The floodwaters, on the other hand, are highly turbid, and they have to be treated at a cost. What I'm arguing is that cost, in the long run, is better and more beneficial at the time. 
because with the reservoirs at the sand quarries, that water can be used for fire protection, which you indicated later is a serious concern to have there available for emergency water. And the water inside the reservoirs, I mean, it's getting bored here, but the water that was put in the reservoirs treats itself. The sediments settle down and the, the, the bacteria um, breaks down, treats itself. Yes, it's filter. Um, almost done here. Okay, so there's a 313 feet. Um, the, the idea of storing water in the ground is, is not a good one. And it's a, as a result of people not wanting to build reservoirs, basically. Um, and the reason why is because it uses a, twice as much energy. You have to collect the water, one, and then you have to bring it to the uh, a well, injection well, which is cost is basically much as a regular well. Less maintenance, but about the same amount of energy. The pumping water. Pump it into the ground, and then guess what? You gotta pump it out back out again. Got more energy, and guess what? You gotta take it and you gotta treat it again. So that compared to doing reservoirs, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The reservoirs um, are there, um, and those those can if engineer. They'll see. The, I I calculate we can inject about 5,000 acre feet of water from those reservoirs every year with using no energy, and that's over double. The, like I said, we only use about 2,300 uh, acre feet per year. Is this a question? Is this in response to? questions about the water supply and conjunctive use, because it feels like it's way off topic to me. Well, just give me another five minutes, I'm just... Uh... This is a presentation of my staff, and it seems like you're diverting the whole conversation into I, dam building. I, 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 I would I, like to hear I'd like to wrap, wrap up over if you could, if you could continue. <coughs> Thanks for the interruption. <laughs> um, uh, well, in a, in a nutshell, again, th this the study. We're not really voting on anything tonight. We're just it's a semblance of data. Again, it's the the, the four different areas, um, and it's taking water, and then it's ASR. It's not specific on the ASR, but the ASR is mainly going to the Posse Tempo well field, and then also um, in the cell system, and that is pumping treated water into the ground basically. Um, and it's taking it from, you know, all the different surface um, things and all those different scenarios, you saw there's, there's four or five scenarios, all those are break, broken down in about five um, scenarios. I know that there's a lot of people, this is an important point, is that a lot of people are going to go, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at this study and I'm going to say, okay, this scenario is the best one. That's not the case, really. If water wasn't political and if we weren't talking about a lot of money, we, this stuff would have already been installed. I mean, we, we already have the inner ties and the pipes and the systems. And um, in other words, you can move water distribution is really not that complicated. And so you can have a system with the pipes that are rec called out in the collection system to move this water. Oh, the Posse Temple well, uh, well filled is low. Flip the switch, water over there, and basically move water around. So the ultimate final solution, if you go with the this plan of conjunctive use, and let's explain clearly why they use the word conjunctive, because I think that's a really confusing about this whole thing. The only reason why it's groundwater and use in conjunction with surface water, and that's the reason why it's conjunctive use. But to me, as an engineer, water is water. Okay, and it's all about moving water, getting it to where it's needed. So, I mean, I, I, you know, I think if you're, if you're talking about the city of Santa Cruz, the city of Santa Cruz shouldn't drain Loch Lomond more than it gets needed the water to get recharged every year. And if we spend all this money with conjunctive use, that's going to save more water. Yes, it's included to take water to Scotts Valley. 
So, and then that, they can take water, they, you know, if, if the city, the city and the Sokup water, I'm, I'm done, I'm done, this is the last point, and this is the last point I'll make. And you, and you know this, the city and Soquel can solve all their problems by recycling the 10 million gallons of water, up to 10 million gallons, that go out into the ocean every year. So they're not good, they don't need any of our water, period. And that's, and they don't need to drain, Loch Lomond is not big enough, it is not big enough. So we need more water storage up here. So, and, um, and then I, I, I'm final thing, is the reservoirs are like batteries, and those, and it's, it, you want to keep the groundwater basin high. And when you have reservoirs, you you know you see them in, in, in droughts in California, and then you see them drain, and then you go, oh wow, you know we better um, do something here. But the, the, they buy it time, because that's what wa water infrastructure is for to buy time to get through the drought. Mm -hmm. So you're very, it's very precarious and, and wasteful to look at the ground, oh, well, that's, that's our storage tank, and then see it, the flip it going up and down, and then spend all this energy to put it in. When you can have reservoirs all full, putting water, keeping the groundwater basin, using that water, keeping that water in, that is not very much cost. And then, um, say, so in conclusion, I just want, you know, I want my voice on this the reservoirs to be heard, and you know, because I, I sort of feel like this you know, uh, conjunctive use is, you know, again getting crammed down the throats of the public without them understanding um, that they're that you know. I know there's a lot of people that are concerned about the environment. I actually feel my kind is environment. You know, so I mean, if the groundwater area in our system is hardscape that could be retrofitted to permeable surfaces because back of an envelope calculation is like 20 inches of rain, one acre gives you about a half a million gallons of potential oh, yeah, recharge. Okay. Yeah. So I don't know that number off the top of my head. Just kind of a like a, a, a wild ass idea. I know about, it's something that we talk about a lot, but I don't know the number. Just um, I know that the hardscape is an issue for recharge. And I'm thinking, yeah. just wondering if there's some part of this that we can avoid having all that water run off into the creek yeah. and recharge it right where we need it as it falls out of the sky. Right. Mostly and streets and parking lots. Right. Streets and parking lots. And they can be okay. retrofitted. Okay, can I move? Yes. I'm I'll gonna. Move. This, last, this last part is going to be pretty quick. Good. <laughs> okay. So, um... Now we're going to talk about the rest of the environmental department's responsibilities. Um, and I'll just jump in. Okay. So I think one thing that's really important to, um, to talk about is that we rely on our built capital to provide, to, to move, to deliver our water to all the houses in this community. We also rely on our natural capital to provide the water resources. And we own and manage 2,000 acres of watershed land, mostly in redwood forest, and um, some of it is in sandhill habitat. And those, we call those ecosystem services. And it's important to keep a healthy ecosystem so we have abund uh, you know, abundant, clean, and um, water resources for future <coughs> generations. So this water district recognized that a long time ago and started acquiring land where, th where those um, surface water sources are and where the groundwater sources are and have protected those for groundwater recharge. Um, so it's important that we continue to invest in those. And stewarding our capital um, is, we're, we're, we're moving forward with an ambitious capital improvement program to be able to stop the leaks and fix the leaky tanks and pump the water more. And so this is, this is a big part of what the environmental department assists with, is that we are responsible for all the permitting for all of these projects. So we have like five projects in the USDA loan program that you guys are aware of. We have the Lion Access Tank. So, um, so our 
responsibility is to work with all the resource agencies in order to make sure we have all the permitting in place, environmental um, permitting for those projects. One I wanted to highlight is the um, Fall Creek Fish Ladder. So this has been something that's been a, a long saga, <coughs> and so I wanted to kind of give a little story about that, and I'll try to make it as brief as possible. But in 2008, we took over the, the Felton water system, and the Fall Creek Fish Ladder at that time was undermined, so the water was flowing under the weirs, so it wasn't a fish ladder, it was just running under. And so um, in 2013, the San Lorenzo Valley Water District went with an emergency repair in order to just get the water to flow over the weirs so that the fish could jump up the ladder and make the Fall Creek, uh, the rest of the Fall Creek watershed, which is all in that state park, accessible for spawning habitat. It's critical. So it's, a, it's a good spawning habitat. And so, um, in, 2000, so in 2015, the Water District um, gave a letter of intent to the Fish and Wildlife Service, Cal, Cal Fish and Wildlife, to say that we intend to improve this fish ladder to make it possible for all life stages of salmonids because the way that it was done when it was an emergency repair, they just tried to fix it as best they could and make the jumps um, accessible. But so they were there between 18 and 24 inches. And the fed and state standard for fish jumps is six inches. So six inches would mean that we would have to rebuild the whole ladder and take up a lot more space. It would have to stretch the ladder up the, up the river, up and down the river, and it would be quite a costly project. So um, there was some word that in 2015 there, the, the regulatory agencies were reevaluating the six inch jump height and there may be a, it, they're like 18 to 24 inches. And so, um, so, so at that time, we thought, well, maybe they're going to change the regulations and they'll make it 12 inches, and then that would be a much more reasonable t like s plan for our ladder because six inches just really makes it um, difficult to build, hard to maintain, and um, and expensive. And so, and then 2017 hit, and the whole ladder filled with debris from the just natural erosion that happened in the upper watershed. It filled the entire ladder with debris and really wasn't accessible, like blocked the access for um, spawning salmonids the following summer, I mean winter. Spa salmonids are spawning usually in the winter. So in 2018, um, we worked with FEMA to get the debris out of the ladder to make it accessible for this winter so this year it looks good and the fish are able to get up into the stream and use that area for spawning again um, we had started in the fall to write um, to request a variance from the six inch jump height for to the fish and wildlife because we'd like to try to get it so we can make it 12 inch jumps we um in our variance request we have a biological justification for that and many of the biologists Don Alley included, um, has, has confirmed that really a, a six inch jump height is uh, extreme and that it's not necessary <laughs> and that juveniles are not necessarily moving up into the watershed. It's a half mile upstream from the confluence of the river. If juveniles are moving upstream in the watershed, they're moving um, just out of the heavy winter stream flows that are happening in the river. Just, so. just real quick. Uh, um, uh, you could possibly, um, just an idea, put little uh, ramps, you know, smooth ramps. Because I obviously fish to kind of swim, they, right, you know, right. like that, if there's like smooth, mm -hmm. instead of a, a rough. Uh, I see. Thing. Just an idea. Okay, thanks for the idea. So, um, so now we're working on that. We haven't gotten approved for the variance yet. We're working on that, and we're um, hoping to construct a new ladder. Hopefully we'll get a variance. Not sure yet. Um, constructing the ladder in 2020. But I think it's important to know that the Fish and Game Code section um, says that anyone who owns a, a, a dam upon which a fishway has been provided shall keep the fishway in repair and open and free from obstructions. And so we need to make sure that this fishway is, is functional for fish passage, whatever that looks like. So, um, 
so, and then I wanted to build, like give a little framework for a capital improvement. Um, the thing about the San Lorenzo Valley is that all that complex geology that I mentioned at the beginning of tonight's talk, all that means that we have a very complex biology as well. And so we have redwood forest, we have oak woodland, we have meadows, we have riparian areas, and we have sand hills. And, um, and many other ecosystems. And in these ecosystems, uh, we have endangered, lots of species that have been listed, are endangered or threatened. And so um, pretty much any construction that we do in the San Lorenzo Valley impacts endangered species or their habitat in one way or another. So all of the work that we do here has significant um, permitting requirements. And that's not always the case. In other places, it's not much of a requirement to if you're not impacting the species. So that's why we have so many environmental review, so much environmental review. So here's some of the projects that are coming upcoming in the Sand Hills projects. Um, the Sand Hills, you know, we provide water to a significant part of our population that lives in the Sand Hills. And so we have a lot of infrastructure in those sand hills. We have pipelines and tanks and um, pumps all, all throughout that habitat area. Their sand hills are varying quality of sand hills. And so, um, so upcoming, just to, to put this on your radar, we are writing a sand hills habitat conservation plan that will include all of the projects, all of the future projects for the water district. And it will it, it looks like a big number for this permit, $129,000, but that's for all of the projects. And if we had to write a habitat conservation plan for each and every one of these projects and others that aren't on this list, it would cost $129,000 each. So what we're doing is we're making one plan for all of the projects and specifying what the compensation will be from the impacts from those projects. And so that should be submitted to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in December of this year. Um, we have the Olympia Conservation <coughs> Management Area, uh, Management Set-Aside. Oh, so we have the, I wanted to mention it because you did say something that you wanted to have some clarity about that. So what's going to come out of that, that conservation plan is that we are going to propose that all the mitigation or all the compensation for the impacts in those projects in Sand Hills, that we put money aside in an endowment, which we've already established through the probation tank, and now the other projects will go into this, the the funds from the other projects will go into that same endowment, which will generate annual funds to protect and manage and monitor this really high quality habitat that we have at the Olympia watershed. And so that will be a um, that will be in perpetuity. So that the district will always have this obligation to um, manage that land, and there will always be funds to do that with. Uh, there's always biological services that are required along with the projects to make sure that we're minimizing any impacts to the species and the habitat, to make sure that we're um, restoring the, the temporary impacts from the construction. And then, um, and then this, and I, we expect that the Sand Hills management will, you know, it'll be growing. I'm going back to the, the mitigation bank or the the set aside with the endowment. Every time we do a project, we'll put more money into that endowment and it'll generate a little bit more. And so we'll have more and more funds in order to manage that property. Um, this is just a short list of some of the permits that are required on typically every project that we do. Um, all different agencies and different staff and it takes a lot of coordination so just, just to kind of give you insight into what those permits look like and what they're called and who we're working with. Um, so in order to, to manage our land that we do own, um, we, in the past at the Olympia watershed, there was a lot of trespass into the habitat areas, into the, 
the, um, the critical habitat areas with motorcycles and camping and parties and just a lot of destruction to the, to the ecosystem there. And so um, we worked out a contract with the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County to monitor and to report back to us if there's any illegal activities happening there. And they do find things every year. They'll find a cut fence with a motorcycle track in there and we'll get out there and fix it. Or they'll, we don't have staff time to be out there eyes on the, on the landscape all the time. So it's been really beneficial and it's been fun. It's, it's worked well to have them um, monitoring it for us. And, and, um, and it's really been, able, we've been able to protect that habitat out there from, from um, human activities. Um, so I'd like to get a recovery permit for pulling invasive species at the Sand Hills Habitat. We're working on that. The reason why that hasn't happened yet is because we're still working on the management and monitoring plan for the conservation set aside. So we want to make sure that all the activities that are specified in that management and monitoring plan are included in the recovery permit so we don't have to go back and get another permit. So it all kind of like builds on top of each other and we have to check the boxes. Um, we do erosion control every year, so we have a contractor who goes out and puts um, water bars on the roads and the trails and makes sure that we're not getting a major landslide because of erosion. And we are we contribute to the fish monitoring annually that, um, that Don Alley has been doing for 20 years. And um, for the last couple of years, we started a broom management on the Olympia watershed. It's really important once you get started that you continue doing that because of the money that you invest in removing the broom, if you don't continue doing that, then the broom comes back and it's wasted investment. So, um, and then we'll be doing a large wood project on Zianti. Grant, if, it's all grant funded and that's with the RCD and the city of Santa Cruz. And that will be uh, to improve in-stream habitat on Zianni, on Zianni Creek, which I mentioned earlier, is one of the most important streams for fish recovery. And so the last two that I'd propose is to have an integrated pest management plan. And the city is doing one of those and it's costing them approximately $50,000. And the watershed management plan is something that has been needed to, to be picked up and carried over the finish line, but that's not, not been uh, the priority. Um, so some other things that we do, we review and comment on project ordinances, legislation um, that might impact district water supplies like timber harvest or the cannabis ordinance, uh, endangered species recovery plans, and and recently on the vegetation management for PG&E, we're just looking at that. Haven't commented, but keeping an eye on it. Um, development of internships and volunteer coordination. We're starting a new um, broom pole, volunteer broom pole on one of the properties in the Redwood Forest, not in the Sand Hills habitat. Um, and we've been working with the Blue Ribbon Panel. And I'm just breezing through this because I know everyone has glossed over. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm tired too from talking. So um, these are some things that I would be elective would be a fire the fire management plan and post fire response plan. Um, doing a greenhouse gas audit annually and um, doing the climate change and adaptation and mitigation plan, which I think is absolutely critical and really a lot of the information that we're getting from our conjunctive use and the other project programs would feed into this um, <coughs> climate change and adaptation and mitigation plan so I think it would be worthwhile to do that and and especially if we can reduce our greenhouse gases community-wide that would be a good um, worldwide you know benefit to the world just a good thing to do um, So I mentioned the urban water management plan, but I don't know if I men mentioned that the urban water management plan will have a climate vulnerability assessment that 
that will be required as part of the urban water management plan coming up. So we could get started on that with our urban with the climate change adaptation and mitigation plan. All right. So we also do all the communications and public engagement. And I'm not going to say them. Um, you guys can see what, what we're doing. Um, we'll be proposing a website update soon. And um, would like to bring to the board uh, to consider getting a public outreach firm to improve our communications from the district. So, and then um, here's our watershed education grant program. These grants motivate local schools, camps, community groups, and individuals to engage with the district and create projects that help improve the knowledge of the environmental health of the San Lorenzo River watershed. The watershed education grant program has assisted the district in meeting the California Department of Water Resources Urban Water Management Plan, demand management measure, um, so far we've awarded 95 projects since 2004, 51 of those were to schools, 31 of those were to community groups um, outside of schools, 13 of them were for data collection and restoration on district lands. We have um, reached 1,600 students per year, 3,200 residents of the valley annually on average, and the average cost to fund it annually is $16,000. So this is, this is a program that I think is a huge community benefit. I, the community really loves this program. I, we get great feedback from the people who participate in these programs. We have a pretty broad reach with this program to, directly to the community, and I think it really gives us a good, um, a good connection to the community through this program. It costs $2 per connection per year, per house, per, house, per year. Um, and then here are just some of the collaborative efforts that we've been, that we do in order to make all of these things happen. We are working with the Santa Margarita Groundwater Management Agency, the Fire Safe Council. Um, I'm on the board of the Fire Safe Council, the Integrated Regional Water Management um, Group program. We we attend those and wait and listen if there are any opportunities for uh, grant opportunities. We participate with the San Lorenzo River 2025, which also is looking for grants and bringing funds from Sacramento into the central coast for water supply and watershed um, efforts. So curiosity, who pays for your involvement with the Santa Margarita groundwater activity? I do that on staff time. So SLB pays for it? Yeah, staff time. Mm -hmm. Um, working with the Felton Library and the Environmental Literacy Park, there could be a programming opportunity that we could reach of the community wide and um, have messaging about water resources and water conservation and, and watershed management and environmental protection and other things that benefit the district. Um, and we, we were a member of the Santa Cruz Mountain Stewardship Network, which is a, a group of large land managers. The Water Conservation Coalition has been a wonderful program to, to coordinate with and cooperate with, and we have been very successful in seeing water con conservation results through that effort. And um, the weed management area of Santa Cruz County, and they're talking about invasive species. <laughs> <laughs> and the state of the, oh, and then we do some, um, some public outreach with the San Lorenzo River Symposium that's coming up next month in March, and then the Connecting the Drops is every other year. <coughs> so this is just a quick little, our time is, we're coordinating 36 projects currently, managing 21 contracts, 
um, overseeing 20 consulting firms and my day is like one action item every 10 minutes on email. <laughs> 10 meetings per week. <laughs> I know I should ask for public comment. It's 10 o'clock. We've got staff here that's been up forever. We've got people who work who are up forever. And so if you don't mind, I don't want to ask for public comment. Okay. Send it in by email. Anyone has yeah. cards? Yeah. I'd like and to get your cards. And the other thing <laughs> is uh, this water availability assessment, water conjunctive use plan. We we can't talk about it tonight. Can you just accept the plan? No. 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 Okay. Not do that. All right. Can I post it to the website? Okay. So uh, let's go to minutes. Uh, what? Yeah, it's on the consent agenda. Anybody want to pull it off? Okay. Uh, I um, I hope nobody minds. We aren't going to discuss these letters. We do have to vote on the consent, right? We need one motion without. Thank you, Governor. Thanks for being here. I thought we didn't have to vote on this. It says right here. I, I understand, but we, as long as it still says here, we have, we have to okay. adopt by one motion yeah, without yeah. discussion. Yeah. We got to do it. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Sorry. That's fine. No, that's you can do it that way. That way. You knew. <laughs> yeah. That's the okay. Um, I would like to adjourn this meeting. Can I just, just make one comment? I know a um, letter from DCOC, it, we have received another letter from him. It's, it's been pretty much taken care of. Okay. He will be getting uh, a fill by mail. He sent another letter and it will be to the board next, uh, okay. next meeting. Oh dear, somebody forgot their hat. Jim Moyer. Okay. Um, Are you going to see him? Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Without me. So, <laughs> there you go. I don't want to have a conversation with you in this meeting. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I do not want to have a conversation with you. No, no. Could, 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 yeah. I would like for this person to quit talking to me. I don't want to be a caller. You have to walk away, Chuck. Go. 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 Go.